Go ahead. Sure, happy to start. Uh, uh, for those of you that I haven't met or don't know me, Andy Wood, I'm a sixth grade teacher of the Proctor Valley School. I just thought I'd say thank you. Thanking the board for their ongoing efforts to help the students and support the teachers. Um, uh, growing up in Massachusetts, my father was a uh, chair of his board, and we um, had a whistle next to the phone, a loud bird whistle that we needed to blow into really loudly if uh, somebody called to harass him about board. <laughs> so I understand it's hard work. Thank you very much. Um, I've been uh, in public school classrooms since 1995, and this is the first time I've spoken at a board meeting, and I'm just here to support uh, the students at the Prosper Valley School and my colleagues. Um, despite um, Aaron's, uh, Mr. C's <laughs> ongoing efforts, um, uh, we are we feel like we're understaffed, and um, he's even relied on public funding to get us up to full capacity to serve the students in our school. Um, despite those efforts, next year we'll actually be down an FT, a half an FTE, while our enrollment next year is going up. So our current enrollment is 76 students. Next year, we'll be up to just about 92 students. This takes our current uh, teacher to student ratio of 15 to 1 and bumps it up to 23 to 1. Um, even if we put a short term patch in place that um, makes a pedagogical overhaul um, in the name of enrollment versus pedagogy, um, a year from now, we would be at 28 to 1 or 29 to 1 across the board. So I think it's important to realize that um, these projected numbers, which I think we'll talk about in a little bit, are based on our current numbers, not the numbers that um, the new build are predicated on, which we've heard at great length that we want to get the numbers up. So we're looking at next year across the board, 23 to 1, but that doesn't include a fifth grade, which would be at about 28 to 1. So again, even if we put a short-term patch into place, that's only for a year. And then across the board, we'd be looking at 29, 30 to a classroom. I think it's important to realize that um, for four out of the next six years, based on the current numbers, we would be above the 25 to one, which is a policy that the board has set forth on the maximum capacity in the classroom. So that's four out of the six next years. Um, currently, between Reading and West, there are six third and fourth grade teachers. And um, as those students matriculate to the Prosper Valley School, they would have a total of four teachers. So that gives you a sense of the numbers. And um, potentially, that would be you know for the multiple years. If they're a big group and they have um, an adverse ratio for themselves that would continue on and follow them year to year. Yeah, I think I'll I think I'll hold there. Thanks very much. Um, thank you. I'm going to go first on that question. Um, I'm Allison. I am currently a sixth grade teacher at Prosper. Next year, I'm moving down to be a fifth grade teacher. Um, a little bit about more about the numbers. And again, I I want to start by saying I think um, there's a lot of budgeting I, I don't understand, and I realize that. I know that Vermont right now is stressed in terms of school funding. Um, I And I think we're in a good position. I think the fact that we have more kids moving here and we have a lot of kids is actually a, a good thing. However, next year, looking at our class sizes, um, we're up to 28 already, and most likely we'll have more move-ins. Um, I'm the mother of a third grade student right now, and so I'm concerned about this both as the parent side and the teacher side. I've taught classes of 28 in Brooklyn before, and it's a very different model than what I think we enjoy here. I'll talk about that more in a minute, but if we look past next year, the incoming third grade would be again, classes of 27 upwards to 30, depending on movements. And again, that concerns me both as a parent and a, and a teacher. 
Um, what we have right now, and we've been working on hard at Prosper Valley, is taking the EL units and um, making integrated science and social studies connections. And we've had really good success with taking kids outside and using the ropes course. Today, we were at VIMS presenting um, green building designs. And in my experience, a lot of these things are things that are just impossible to do in a class of 30. Um, behavior goes up, it's harder to take them outside. Um, a lot of the things we, we've had success with at Prosper, I'm a little afraid that we would uh, lose. So I encourage you to consider some of, I think, some teacher ideas around some potential solutions we may have, but also in terms of looking at a longer term plan for how we can keep Prosper Valley the school that it is. Thank you. Yes. Hi there, I'm Mackenzie Hendricks. I'm a sixth grade teacher at Prosper as well. Um, I'm also a little nervous. It's much harder to talk to a room full of adults than you do. Um, but I'm going to talk about some specific points that I think really um, take home why we want smaller class sizes and how it impacts specifically the students. And so um, one of the things I did at the beginning of the year was I sent out a parent survey a few weeks into school. And across the board, all the parents that participated, the number one thing that they contributed to their child's success and difference in their education that year compared to the year prior was class size. So 100% of involvement all said that that was the number one reason why their child was having a better year. Um, I think all of the teachers talked about how in parent conferences, and that all of the guardians were talking about how that was the biggest impact on their students. So not only the survey, but also the um, just the parent conferences and interactions I've had. It's just a common statement of my child is having such a better year this year. And um, I'd love to take credit for that as the teacher, but I know that most of that is because of the smaller class sizes. Um, one of the I have a quote from one of the parents from the survey, and they said, my daughter is having a great time at school. All the field trips have been a highlight. The smaller class size has really helped to, to bring out the best in her. She's really been trying this year to do her homework early, making a better effort to read every night. She's coming home most days with a big smile on her face. So I think that this speaks to it's impacting the students, but also the parents are seeing a difference in their children when they're in smaller class sizes. Um, one of the things we see when you have larger class sizes is an increase in behavior. And I feel like it's not additional with every child, it's exponential. So when you have more children in a classroom in a tight space where they're on top of each other, behaviors are gonna increase. So looking at this current sixth grade class that Andy, Allison, and I are teaching, um, I was not here last year, but when they were in fifth grade, they had a total of 170 behavior incidents reported. Um, I know we're not done with this year, but we have 27 more days of school. And as of right now, that's half. So this current, the class that had 170 last year is now at 67 behavior incidents this year. And I think a lot of that is due to smaller class sizes. They're not on top of each other and they're able to have space to decompress um, and learn and um, be in smaller groups. Um, I'm also um, a parent within the district. I have a son that's going to, be going to kindergarten next year. We're new to Vermont. Um, part of the reason why we moved here was because of this school district. Um, I come from Florida and I really wanted to be in a small community where I felt like my son got to be a part of the community. And so I'm just concerned as I'm about to send him to kindergarten, seeing these projected numbers and I know my son, and he's just not going to thrive in a classroom of 28. And so I just feel like if the district is going in this direction, um, as a parent, I'm already looking at alternative options. And I feel like that's going to be, other parents are going to be doing the same. And so I know that the district is wanting to increase numbers, but I think that if we have these large class sizes, that may not happen if a lot of people are going to try to move out of districts to get smaller class sizes. Um, the last thing I just want to um, touch on, because I think that we've, spoken about how this is a Vermont issue. Um, Ms. Green did some research um, at the some of the fifth grade surrounding schools in the Upper Valley. Um, as of this school year, tw uh, 2023 to 2024, Plainfield had a class size of 12 to 16 students with a general ed para classroom. 
Hanover, um, the grade school had 16 students per class with two adults, teacher and an assistant, not including any one on the side. Hartford had a class size of 14, and Marion Cross had a class size of 20 to 21 students, two homeroom teachers and one special education teacher between the two homerooms, one one-on-one -on -one and one ed assistant who split their time between fifth and sixth. So um, the surrounding schools do have smaller class sizes than what's being projected for us next year in the fifth grade class and then in the following years. So I think this is something that we've all discussed, but we just wanna make sure and urge the district to make decisions more on pedagogy and best practices and not make decisions based on um, changing enrollment. I think one of the proposed ideas is mixed classrooms. And as a team, we've talked about how that just doesn't match with our teaching style. And it's still gonna be a classroom size of 23 for next year. So these mixed classrooms that we're looking at are sizes of like 12 to 18. When you're in a class size of 22 to 24 with mixed ages, that's gonna be really difficult to provide those great opportunities that I think brought me all the way from Florida to come to Crossroads. So thank you. Thank you. Um, Mallory, on, online, yeah. Hi, thank you. Um, I am Mallory Bennett. I have a kiddo at Prosper right now and also a kiddo at West that's coming up to Prosper next year. I just wanted to speak to the alternative that the school board is discussing with the combined classes. When Prosper moved within West, we combined classes for a couple of the age groups, and I just want to speak to it being an absolute disaster for the kids. Um, both age groups were not able to thrive. There was chaos, there were behavioral issues. It was an absolute mess. We also had COVID, so there was a lot going on there. But I just want to urge you to come up with a fantastic solution because already next year, we have a transition year for these fourth graders, which is proven to be tough going from fourth to fifth grade into a new school. We have a brand new principal who has never been a principal before. However, we do have really high hopes and we know that Mr. Workman is going to do a fantastic job. But it's really important that we set Mr. Workman up for success. We set the teachers up for success and we set the students up for success. I urge you to find a, a solution. And if it requires us digging really deep into the budget, it's it's really important. Thank you. I just wanna kind of conclude our group here. Um, I'm Gracie Grant, I'm the teacher at Prospect Valley. I do walk a little bit nervous, like it can be easy to talk in front of students. Um, I want to go over some solutions that we have kind of come up with as a team. Um, I've spoken to a few teachers in Massachusetts um, about team teaching. Uh, that would be a model where Alice and I would be team teachers for a whole group, meaning we would essentially would like to take down a wall at Prosper Valley to make a classroom much larger to fit the amount of students that we could in the classroom. However, a team teacher model allows for more of a thematic pedagogy. Um, and we would have um, a gen ed para with us. So if we have two teachers and the whole group, and then we have a gen ed para. This would also allow us to kind of stand top of the behaviors because we both would be in there kind of going back and forth, um, allowing also the gen ed para to kind of team in on that. The other solution we would like to propose is just a third teacher um, and then a para kind of rotating between the classes. I think. Those are the two most viable solutions. Otherwise, we are looking at classroom sizes of 28 each, and 28, again, is not. I had 25 in my classroom uh, last year. <laughs> they did not fit well. Um, it was very challenging um, to go outside and utilize the grounds that we had. Um, you're always relying on, hopefully, someone who's available to help you. It is not safe to take 25 students out on my own. Um, so we need to have some other solution. Our two solutions, I think, are probably the best possible to propose. The mixed um, age classes isn't the best solution because, again, our class sizes would still be 23 to 24 um, per class. And that's a wide range for a teacher to not only plan for, but to kind of meet the needs of every student in that classroom. Um, and a lot of things probably wouldn't really not that it would get missed, but it's really hard to meet the needs of that range of um, student needs. 
So um, those are the two primary solutions that we kind of are working towards. The, the one that is the team teaching model, that would also um, provide for a really kind of seamless curriculum for the whole grade as well. So thank you. Yes, bro. Thank you for knowing me. <laughs> uh, I'm not a Cross Valley High School teacher, but I was. Uh, I taught for 41 years, 30, well, actually 28 at the Pompa School of Cross Valley and three at West for the mold year. Uh, you'll note that when I heard the two minute piece, I just text out a good chunk and this is the best part. So, and I'm going to read this verbatim. For those of you who know me, you'll know that's a good thing. <laughs> so, um, so uh, there are, of course, many factors that result in great schools, but two consistently rise to the top. First, schools find, hire, and support highly effective teachers. Second, they create the conditions needed for a growth mindset culture of learning. TPPS has highly effective teachers, which is evident to anyone familiar with the school. As being uh, and being immersed directly with students hour by hour, day by day, week by week, year by year, for me, decade by decade, but that's <laughs> sorry, I'm not sure. They understand best the territory of TPBS better than anyone, especially in understanding of the students and what works and what doesn't when creating a culture of growth for our kids. This include um, this including teachers in a substantial way in making the most important educational decisions for TPBS is vital for creating and sustaining a healthy culture of student learning. The second attribute of a great school. Creating a condition where growth mindset takes hold is something the entire school community, parents, administration, teachers, the board, support staff, the broader community, and whoever else I left out, and whenever possible, students themselves are responsible for. Due to my experience in teaching both large schools, I taught for 10 years in California with an enrollment at that school of over 800. I had 30-ish, one side of the other, per class, about 120 kids per day, uh, and small schools across uh, the top school became too small. <laughs> and that was 60 to 110 students. I've been asked to briefly speak to two such conditions, class size and scheduling. I'll keep these as brief as I can. Class size, my experience with the effect of class size of uh, student learning, there's class that are too small. Uh, if you have under a dozen children, your diversity drops, and obviously the financial resources of the community you know, are at risk as well as we've found out you know, at, at uh, conference. Too large, uh, and to me too small would be you know, under a dozen, uh, but again, every class is different, uh, every student is different. Too large, I would say one uh, ratio of one to 20 to one to 30 is too large. Uh, it increases, um, you lose all personalized teaching and peer relationships, a loss of effective addressing the needs of the diversity of students, intellectual, behavioral, emotional. From my experience, especially during my 10 years in California, large class sizes inevitably resulted in the classroom becoming more of an institution than a tight-knit and personal learning community. It also correlated with both teacher and student burnout. Goldilocks. I'd say Goldilocks 1 to 14, 1 to 20, I found to be a really good range in terms of a classroom culture. It allows teachers to establish a deeper relationship with the class as a whole, but as importantly, with the needs of individual students. The combination is much more likely for the teacher to create engaged classroom culture and listeners and a rich, safe, manageable outdoor experiences. If you want those at all, you go above 20, especially 25, um, don't even go there because that's obviously a much harder thing to do. TPS is known as an outdoor environmental school to some extent, and I think that a lot of that would be lost. Uh, and by the way, uh, the conference school was built for K-6 classrooms of a maximum, for a maximum of about 20 students square footage. I had the tape measure out a few years ago and measured both conference school and West, where I taught, and there's about a quarter uh, smaller difference between a uh, public school and West. So you're putting students uh, at that age level into an environment that is not, uh, not built for them. And I will just make this super brief. Scheduling and integrated curriculum, um, block sizes if you're going to schedule should be uh, well over an hour. I'd say 90 minutes. If you're going to do the type of teaching these teachers do in terms of experience-based 
uh, and going deep into literature, mathematics, whatever it happens to be, you need those larger blocks. So scheduling can really hinder an effective classroom. Look at the water symposium, integration across the curriculum. Yes, science and math, what's the science and math? Yes, science and social studies were a huge part of that and should be a huge part of any young child's education. Um, I'm not biased there. Uh, but that water symposium went across from the curriculum. Great literature discussion, uh, great mathematics happening, um, great purpose for what they were doing in terms of clean water. That's probably more than enough. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Anybody else? Yes. Yes, sorry. Let me just bring up some notes really quickly. Uh, my name is Dan Fiedler. I am a parent uh, of a son in fifth grade. And I'm here tonight. This is only the second time I've been to the board meeting. Um, the last time was for a meeting on discipline issues that brought up a large audience here. Um, and I'm only here today because I haven't opened my email. I saw a message about um, this this issue of the fifth, sixth grade. Um, I have a vested interest because I have a, a child in the fifth grade going to sixth grade. Um, and so first of all, thank you to the board for your service. Thank you to the educators in the room, the teachers. Um, uh, he, I'm here also just representing parents that say, uh, we wanna make sure we you, you know, help you in terms of having the resources and you know, everything that you need in order to uh, effectively teach our children uh, in the classroom. And so I don't have much to say beyond that. I hope there's gonna be much greater discussion on this issue of combining fifth and sixth grade. I'm just curious, um, you know, hearing about classroom size, how that affects learning, um, you know, how do combined grades, how does that affect learning? Um, is this a budget issue or is this driven um, by what's best for kids uh, and what our teachers and other experts uh, in education are telling us? Um, as rising fifth graders uh, going into TBBS, uh, we got our Cognia uh, scores for my son in uh, October. Um, they were very concerning. I, I felt like um, the school district really didn't address the Cognia scores um, very broadly. Um, in kind of the performance overall. Uh, in the fifth grade, um, the results were 71% of the students in fifth grade were performing below average. Uh, so level one or two in math and approximately half were below standard for the ELA. Um, I understand that Cognia uh, is only one uh, metric, you know, one measure for, for evaluating kids' performance. Um, had a great conversation with Dr. C uh, and with my son's teacher, Ms. Koresh, felt very confident in terms of how they're approaching this um, and, uh, and also equally confident in TPBS and the experience my daughter had there previously. But we won't know how those kids are doing um, until we see the next Cognia test results. And my understanding is we probably won't see that until perhaps this decision is already made. And so I just want to be mindful that any decisions made about class size, about classroom, there's a teacher to student ratio, about combining fifth graders and sixth graders, what is that impact on education for potentially a grade of students that's already uh, performing below average? Um, and I'll wrap it up there. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'll make a public comment. I'm, I'm a board member of Matt South, but I do have a son who's in fifth grade at Foster Valley School. Um, I do not want to see fifth, sixth uh, combined. I do not think that will be good for, for the kids. Um, I'm also aware that the space of the room, they're not very large. My son's class now is less than 20, and it's already seemed very tight. So I can't imagine how you put 28 kids in a single classroom. Um, just, you know, now speaking as a board member, um, we approved the five full-time teaching positions. When the third position was added for the sixth grade, it was approved. It was funded by an outside person and then the, it got brought back to the board as a, as a full-time position that would get funded every year in the budget and we approved it. So we approved five full-time teachers. And I don't think people are aware that the issue has been created because a teacher took a different position, create, leaving only four full-time teachers. That's what created the issue that the board is not. I mean, we. We are hearing this for the first time tonight from you. There's no committee, to my knowledge, I sit on one of them that has been asked uh, 
you know, had been told that we had we've lost a teacher there. And I've been asked, I'm on buildings and ground, I've been asked to remove a wall, and it is not our first choice in that building because of all the work that we did to remediate mold. Uh, and and it's difficult once you put a temporary wall back in place in terms of acoustics, it doesn't work very well. Most teachers complain about them once there is a temporary wall. Um, and I'll I'll stop with that. Thank you. My name is Kelly Lynn, and I asked a question two meetings ago, and I still have got no answers and no results, but I'm also going to touch base on what you just said. That is, so who's the superintendent? That's right, you. So that means that you should know that one of your teachers has got moved into another position. Am I right or wrong? So if you're in charge, well, I'm very well aware. I've met with the faculty. I know how positions are. So that means that the board should have already been told by you that they lost the teacher and they moved to another position. If you work for the board, which works for the townspeople. So why didn't one of your board members get that information? And that's been the question. So for point of order, this is a this is yeah. public comment. It's not, not meant to be back and forth with public in your right. dialogue. Yeah, just like anybody else that wants to speak has got six minutes because some of yours ran six minutes. So just clarifying for you. I'm just asking asking how come I didn't get a my minutes for or my the policy that I asked about for the security of sports where money has changed hands. Comments should be directed to the board chair. What's that? Point of order. Comments should be directed to the board chair. No, Carrie. Yeah. Yes, I recall that you asked for some information around the, the funds, but can you well, allow around the funds just what the policy is? for having security. Okay. Like I said, Paul West did it for a number of years. When Paul stepped down and retired, I came on board. That was back when Greg Schillinger was still here. And we, shortly after I was here, um, we had an incident on the soccer field. I was the first one on the field. Greg was right directly behind me. And I can bring down Craig Mosher. He was one of the parents there. And he grabbed a hold of me, spun me around, saw who I was. So oh, I'm sorry, Kelly. I said, no, we just need to clear the field and let the umpires do their job. And I got everybody off the field. We had incidents in that building right there back when Wendy Wallop was still the director. We had a kid that from Windsor who put a, his fist through the windshield, the window in there going into the girls' locker room. That got handled and paid for by the parents. So I'm asking, as a concerned citizen, what, who is going to do this now? What are the policies? If somebody comes here and goes into the building when, or outdoors, even if there's a supporting event going on, and pulls a knife, are you going to run out on the field? Because I can tell you right now, I will be more than happy to run onto the field because every student here matters to me. Okay, but well, I will make sure that that gets looked at. So if you can get me the what the policy is for sporting events or any event that money has changed hands, because that's what the policy used to be, was any of that, whether it was yo or what dance or whatever, had security at it. And probably if I went up and saw Fire West, I could be able to go back right into Paul's stuff and find the policy back then and see if it's the same for today. Okay. I will I appreciate look into that. Getting that paperwork if I could. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Yes. Um, I want to circle back to Prof Valley. My name is Jeremy Fryer from Woodstock. Uh, I've got a sixth grader this year and a fourth grader coming up. Um, I just kind of want to tie uh, our perspective into the discussion. Uh, when when the school was reopened, I was initially skeptical. I, I thought 
Southwest was where my kids were going to go to school. Um, and since then, they've had a tremendous experience with Prosper. I think a lot of people deserve credit for that. Um, I really couldn't be happier. So we have a unique, I don't know how it happened, but I think there are seven or eight families with fourth grade or sixth graders. So we can we can bring the perspective of the, the class that's been circulating out and fears of, of whether we'll be able to continue um, what's been a success for, for our younger siblings as they come up. So I'd really like to just keep in mind, you know, what, what has made it work over the last two years. And I don't, I certainly would give a lot of chief, uh, credit to the administration, to the principal, to the teachers, the class sizes, a lot of things have gone right. And uh, I would really hold it up as the model school in the district. Um, speaking again, just from my perspective. So I hope we don't lose sight of what's contributed to that. Um, we talk a lot of work about a constant improvement mindset, always trying to improve things. And um, it's a challenge when things have gone so well this year, how you improve upon it. Um, but I think it's understandable that people have a fear of backsliding um, we, when we remove. And I think that's kind of what uh, people are, are concerned about. And I don't think anything's been fully baked. So I don't think, uh, I think there's time to hopefully figure it out. And I hope the perspective of the teachers and the, and the students are taken into account uh, with that. I just think the, the campus, the teachers, and the and the platform has really unlocked a lot of energy, a lot of potential in these kids. The teachers have been allowed to, to do their thing and maximize that. And it's been really, really fun to watch. Uh, and you see it in all the kids. So I think the school is a, is a, a huge success. I think the kids are advocates for the school. I think its um, behaviors are way down. Engagement is way up. And uh, we got to try to maintain it as best we can. So just just uh, sharing sharing some perspective, and I think a lot of credit goes to to everybody involved in reopening that school and getting where it is today. It's a shame to see it go backwards, but I'm not. I think we could probably figure it out. Um, but hope everybody can be heard. Thank you. Anybody else? Yes, in the back. Garrett, so hi. <laughs> More, thank you so much. My name is Ryan Lebeck. I'm also one of the parents of a rising seventh grader, now sixth grader, and a rising fifth grader, now fourth grader. So seeing both sides of the dynamic. And uh, we were new to the community last year, the first year in the community. And um, we were fortunate to have Francine as our first teacher for our older guy. Um, and one of the things that we immediately noticed in that classroom of 25 kids is that Francine was put in an impossible situation to succeed, mm -hmm. and both for the students and for the teachers involved. And you can imagine your own kids, just whatever age your kids are right now, imagine days after days coming home in tears, regressing academically, because there's just not enough bandwidth for even the most capable teacher to manage a class size for that age. Now, contrast that to this year, where in Mackenzie's class, an equally amazing teacher. And the big difference is that our kids are now in a classroom of 14 kids. And that change from 25 to 14, understandably, is probably not a realistic situation. But finding a middle ground that's sub 19, 20 kids, that's where the data shows that learning outcomes suffer. 19 to 20 kids is once you get north of that number, learning outcomes start to suffer. So while the mixed age classroom, I think, is one that's an interesting, innovative idea, I think it presents a tremendous number of challenges because it's still 23 kids, it's still a wide range of learning needs and uh, requirements. And to echo Matt's uh, comments, it's also my understanding that the grant position that was funded last year was funded on the condition that the district would continue to fund that third teaching position this year and into the future. So um, I would strongly advocate that the board and the administration look deep into the budget and find a way to make it work. 54 rising students into fifth grade this year. That's 27, 28 kids without any new matriculation at all versus 35 a year. Up. It's a big class. So urge you to consider the solution of digging deep in the budget, finding a way to make that third position work and finding the funds to make that happen. Thanks. Thank you. 
<clears throat> Anybody else? Yes. Okay. Hi, I'm Elizabeth Reeves. I'm a Woodstock resident. My son, Laszlo, is a third grader. So he is part of that class that will eventually matriculate into Prosper Valley. He will, um, if there isn't an additional teacher at Prosper Valley, he will be in one of those 28 to 29 to 1 um, ratio classrooms. The, um, currently, he's in a class size of 20, and this is already affecting his learning. <laughs> so just as an example, um, Lazo's come home all year, excited about school, but complaining about the way that instruction has been continuously dis been disrupted in his class. He is an excellent teacher, um, but again, classroom management is really hard at that 20 to 1 ratio. And this played out um, around the cognitive testing. So in, su in support of the evidence that better outcomes are linked to the smaller class size, Lazo came home from cognitive testing a couple weeks ago. I asked him how it went. He said it was great until we got to decimal, and it's not fair. And I said, well, why isn't it fair? He said, well, the other classes the other third grade classes have already um, completed their decimal unit. We weren't able to get to it because our class is behind because there's so much disruption in our class. And so I think that's just an example of why we need to continue to be really um, vigilant about class size and um, supportive of the solutions that the teachers here are, are bringing forward because also I don't feel like mixed classes are the answer. I'm also here for another reason today, um, it's my understanding that the Unified Arts Program is um, potentially on the table for some cuts in not this next year, but in the 2025 year. Um, I know that we're very supportive of the, um, the direction that the school is taking around implementing the science of reading, but we are not, um, our family is not supportive of cutting uh, the Unified Arts Program as a way of trying to implement the science of reading um, principles. And that's because reading proficiency is not just about reading speed and reading agility. It's also about reading comprehension. Reading comprehension is directly correlated with the breadth of experience that our students have. And our students get experience through their arts programming through STEM classes and through being exposed to science and social studies in the classroom. So for God's example of that water symposium integration that happened throughout um, Prosper Valley School. Um, and so in, in just as an example there, Laszlo has been exposed to African American history, Latin American history, Cuban um, history through his music class this year, women's history, um, just through music. And when we were practicing for the math kangaroo challenge, but I love math, um, and we were practicing our tests, two thirds of the questions that and on those tests were spatial and logic logic reasoning, something that we hadn't been exposed to in the classroom, but had been exposed to in art and STEM. So art being able to do proportion and think and dimension, and STEM class using spatial reasoning and logic is A then B. And that really helped him um, be able to excel in that math kangaroo challenge and that math kangaroo challenge. So we know that these decisions haven't been made, and we've come um, with a few asks for the board so that we can be more involved in that decision making process. Um, so we would really like to ask if the board can create some way for parents who want to be involved in the decision-making process around unified arts and um, the implementation of the literacy goal, if there's a way for me to sign up so that we can really stay um, on top of the decision-making process um, so that it's easy to track and for us to stay involved. We would like more transparency regarding the process that the district is using to decide on the changes to the unified arts program so this is transparency around timelines around that decision making so that we can be involved, as well as transparency around the evaluation criteria that are being used to make these decisions. So we know that there was a pilot phase. What is the feedback then from the pilot phase? How is that pilot phase evaluation being used um, as part of the decision making process? And then we are requesting that a copy of the Nate Levinson New Solutions K-12 report on which the proposed changes are largely based 
be made available to the community. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Hi, my name is Deirdre Black Rubin. I have a sixth grader, a, a third grader, and a toddler, and I live in Woodstock. Um, and thank you for the opportunity to talk tonight. I'd like to just echo everything that Elizabeth just said about the Unified Arts um, program. I'm asking you not to cut um, art, music, Spanish. Um, I feel like I'm missing one. Yeah. Yeah. Um, these classes are really important. I think that when our kids come home, we one of the questions we ask are, what specials did you have today? And we ask that because that's what the kids love to talk about. That's a highlight of their day. That's something that brings them to school. I'm homeschooling one of my children now, and he still goes in for these classes, art, music, STEM. He loves these classes. Um, and um, asking you, please don't give us fewer sessions per week of these classes, that doing that will cut the curriculum significantly. It will cut the number of topics that our kids get to be exposed to, the number of art projects that they get to do, and so on. Um, second thing here tonight to speak about is, of course, the class size at TPVS for next year. So I wanted to share that I've I've taught at many schools, Wesleyan University, um, the Master's School of a Boarding School in New York. My children have attended many schools, and I believe that the educators at TPBS are really among the best that I've I've seen. They are amazing, creative, caring, kind, dedicated educators. Um, we had my son, oldest son, had Francine Franich his first year at TPBS. And really, I feel there was never a day that I did not hear, this friend is just so nice. She's always, nice. She's always in a good mood. She's always smiling. Um, Andy is running clubs for um, rope climbing, biking, has been volunteering to do that. You know, organize on one of the class trips, he, his wife made cookies and left them out for the kids to come across and find. Things like these are just amazing. My son left something at school that he needed for his project this weekend. Allison went over there and picked it up and brought it to us. These are incredible educators and we need to support them. They're out here saying, you know, the class sizes will be too big if we don't have another full-time educator. Um, they're out here saying we don't want to combine the fifth and sixth grade together. That's too much. They will rise to any you know, situation you put them in, I'm sure, but they shouldn't have to. Let's support them. Let's support our children. Let's give them another full-time educator. Thank you. Um, Lara, and then back there. Hi, Lara Bowers. I uh, work at Bridgewater, and apparently I'm also part of the club of parents who have a fourth grader and a sixth grader. So <laughs> thanks for joining me um, in that. Uh, and I just want to say that I, I hear you because uh, when my son was in fifth grade, there were at least once a week, he's like, it was so difficult today because people were talking all the time and I couldn't learn. And, you know, he didn't, he liked going to school, but like, uh, it was it wasn't his big favorite year. And this year he's just having a blast and he's in this math class. So 14 students. Um, so I can definitely tell the difference. And um, personally, I used to teach in a much larger place, um, and I had classes up to 35. And um, yeah, it's not good um, that that school would sometimes have students sitting on the floor because there was just no way to fit enough desks in the space. So I hear you, and uh, we'll find something that works. Yes. Hi, Holly Gaspar, parent of a fourth grade, no, fourth grader, going to fifth grade, um, uh, and I said I was going to here to not talk, <laughs> right? Um, because I have faith in the board, and you're clearly there's faith in our teachers. Um, this elementary school experience, I grew up in a very similar town, a very similar community in Massachusetts. It was not the experience that I had. Um, and everyone keeps saying, just wait until we get to prosper. Um, just wait until your child gets to prosper. Hearing the things 
that brought me to the meeting tonight did not give you that faith that these changes are going to happen. We're going to continue to have some of the same challenges with parents in this community. However, the hiring of Lori Beeland that all of you felt really strongly with and helped us push forward, given some of the challenges at West over the last couple of years, you know, has been a blessing. And those kids that are running out through COVID made a tremendous impact on all of our communities. And we've heard a lot about the academics, which are so important. We've heard a lot of numbers, but the behavioral health, the trauma, the emotional well-being of these kids, if that is not addressed, and I'm telling you, large class sizes. I was an educator, worked in nonprofits. It's why I went into working with kids for decades, because of that single point of touch with people that they look up to, like teachers. It's why we keep the profession going. There are huge gaps right now of our teaching community here in our own district. We're going to burn them out. Never mind the kids if we're making some of these changes. So please consider what the parents are saying tonight. It's why we came here. It's why we're speaking out in support of some of these changes. I am a little bit surprised to hear of these changes after town voting and then we passed the budget, which I was like, woohoo, we passed our school budget. And now I'm hearing about all these things that could affect our kids and our schools. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Yes. Uh, my name is Taryn. Uh, I guess I'm also part or was part of the club of an upcoming fifth grader and seventh grader who unfortunately is no longer in the district to no fault of the teachers. Um, he was at Prosper last year and I give so much credit to every single teacher and administrator there. Um, but he cried every day when I dropped him off. The class sizes were too big. Um, the behavioral issues just were not addressed. And we couldn't do it anymore. And it was a huge, a huge change for our family to not have him go back. And I would talk to Francine on the phone. I talked to Ms. Green, Mr. Wood, you know, and I was so glad to hear that this year there were three sixth grades um and jackson misses his friends like you know and he loves it but he's in a he's in a school where there are 12 to 14 sixth graders and it's made a world of difference you know he was really struggling in reading um he now is taking he's speaking french he is um in STEM, which he loves, he just participated in the Gates program. And, you know, my daughter is moving up and West the elementary school has been great. But I just, these teachers need our help. They need support. They need smaller class sizes. And, you know, we can't expect them to teach in classes of 25 to 30 kids. Like you just, you don't have that. And, you know, my son, he was a very good student, um, but the behavioral issues are the reasons that we, you know, I knew we needed to do something else. And I know this is a great community. My kids, we moved here in 2019. My husband grew up here. Um, so it's, we've been in the school since they were pre-Kers, first grade. Um, and I, want this place to succeed. And I think the first thing we need to do is to support the teachers to keep them. Um, so if I was, like I said, it's not my of speaking tonight, but um, you know, that is my hope that we can keep these classes small and keep what is really good here going. So thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? All right. Uh, is there any other public comment on, on, on any other topic? All right. Well, thank you all for coming tonight and sharing your thoughts and your concerns. I'm sure that we will have more discussions uh, around this issue and consider along with administrators and superintendent um, what can be done to to uh, address those concerns. So thank you very much.
Yeah. All right. Uh, we now have the superintendent's report. All right, so you have in front of you our new strategic plan. Uh, one of my goals for this year was to work with the community and the design team to create the next strategic plan for our next five years. So in um, March, you approved the goals, you presented them, and they were approved. The last board meeting, you saw the annual report, which was the closing of the last strategic plan. And so this is our next roadmap for the next five years. Um, it recognizes the hard work of the group that came together. We had community members, parents, students, board members, faculty, administration. Um, it is better than the last one. And I'm gladly so. The last first five year strategic plan came with a hefty load. We carried that through COVID. Um, I think we were, the design team put a lot of effort in terms of really refining what the expectations are for the next five years. Um, we redid our portrait of a graduate. You can see that focuses on academic success instead of achievement, really expanding our understanding of what does success look like post-secondary. So we're having some good conversations, already beginning some of that work. So. This is your new strategic plan. So that is my report for the board. Any questions about this? A chance to look at it. Yeah. Thank you. Well, I see and that some of the board people board. who are participating are here in the meeting as well as around the table. So yeah. thank you to all of you for what you did. And um, if anyone would like to speak to it who was on the committee, we welcome that. <laughs> There are, um, Amy, can you pass some of those in the behind you? Sure. 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 I'm, I'm sorry, yeah. I, I can't seem to find the link to the strategic plan in the board book. Am I missing um, it? We didn't have it uh, digitally available. I'm sorry. Oh, we okay. Get you a copy, Sam. Okay, no worries. I just I thought I was going crazy and I just couldn't see it. Okay, I look forward to reading it when I get a digital copy. Thank you. You're welcome. Yes, Meg. I'll just take a minute. My name is Meg Seely, and I'm here with my daughter Logan. Um, we participated together on this committee at the invitation of the superintendent. I participated five years prior to the last one. And that was a really rewarding experience. This one, however, was amazing in that it really, we did a lot of soul searching and we came, we had the students in the alternate classes were remarkable and testimonies to the education and the life experience they're getting um, growing up in this town and going to school. Um, we learned a lot from them. I think we took our, our we got, they guided us a lot in the small field activities facilitation. Um, I'm really proud of this. I think it takes a lot of the stigma away from the students who choose an alternative course after they leave this school. I'm just most proud of that. And yeah, I just wanted to say, Chair, thank you. It was amazing. Thank you all. Thank you. Community involvement made a lot of great people. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. All right. Thank you, Sherry. You're welcome. Uh, next up is uh, Raph. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Corinne has her hand. Oh, sorry. Yeah, Corinne. Just super quick. I just wanted to ask that the if once we do have electric electronic copy that be shared with with the full board, so all of us who are not there could take a look. Absolutely. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. 
Okay. Uh, you me, everyone. Um, different topic of conversation now. We'll put it on some technology pieces. Um, really excited to share with you tonight um, some work that uh, this group of educators and I have been working on. Um, back in December, um, a group of educators reached out to me, and they're curious about how we can begin to think about providing some guidance around artificial intelligence um, for what students are using and what what staff and faculty and teachers are using. Um, and what I'm excited to share tonight is when you're really grappling with how to kind of navigate and balance some competing interests here, and, and, and one being um, the incredible power of these tools that our students and educators are seeing and the potential value in the way that it's shaping our world. And the other being some real concerns about privacy um, and, and other pieces, how the models work and, and how they're made. And trying to figure out how is an, how is an organization, how do we balance that? Um, so after a lot of thinking, what, what we're planning to do, the idea that we came up with was um, to really take advantage of the terms of service of a couple of these softwares and put that question to parents. Um, so two of the most prominent, or one of the most prominent tools um, states that in their terms of service that students or kids age 13 to 18 need parental permission to be able to, to use their tool. Um, and so the idea that we were, we were gonna bring forward is to, at the middle school, high school, to put that question in our annual forms and allow parents to be able to decide whether they would like the school to sanction their child to be able to use that. And the reason we want to do that is because we feel that that will respect parent choice in that matter, but also give some of our educators a choice um, if they would like to pursue that and um, embed that into their teaching more. Um, so this felt like a good compromise. We'll definitely need to revisit this in the future. There may be a time when we, we do sanction the use of some of these tools, but as it is really cutting edge and things are changing so quickly, we felt like this was a way to sort of balance those two competing interests. Um, Any questions for Rev? Well, real quick, just a practical one, like how do you, uh, let's look at a year, two years from now, where a teacher has decided to incorporate AI with the learning and there are students who can't do it? Is it literally just like get up and get the room? No. no. <laughs> um, so, so what part of the guidelines that we're starting to craft is that um, for for educators, you know, there'll have to be some sort of alternative options or, or ways for for educators to incorporate and to allow students to engage in that lesson in a way that they can um, participate full. And so our educators are really well versed in doing that and sort of offering different options. Um, but at least for the start, those educators that are really interested in working with AI more um, may have, will have to do that. They'll have to come up with some alternative options for those assignments that, that, that will happen. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, Corinne. Thanks. Yeah, I, I had a sort of similar line of thinking, but one of the things I thought about is when you get that as a parent, when you get that question, when you're going through your forms at the beginning of the year, it's probably fairly opaque what the stakes would be for your child, you know, who, if you, if you decide, no, I don't want them to use it, or I do want them to use it. So some way of sort of communicating um, to the parents, you know, what you just said, Raf, that, you know, this, this wouldn't be, it's like all of these technology questions, right? So if I tell my kid not to use this, how much are they going to be excluded from you know, one social things is one one thing, but if you're talking about educational experiences, that's another. So um, I guess the the idea is just maybe um, including some sort of context or framing of it when when we do include that in uh, in the questionnaire might be helpful for parents. I totally agree. We're going to have to work. We've never done this before, so we're going to have to work on how we communicate that and, and, and try to do that as best as we can. But yeah, totally agree that this is a this is a new frontier for us. We've never tried to communicate something like this in an annual form, um, but we'll, we'll try and we'll see how we do and we'll revise and get better as we do a little more. Could you use GPT to create the form? <laughs> well, well, one of the pieces that we are thinking about doing is is, is actually you know putting something where if students or staff members or faculty use it in some way that there is an acknowledgement 
that, that you know, yes, this was ideas were generated from this, or you know, this was used to help assist in that issue. And, and sort of to bring forward that as like modeling positive and healthy uses and acknowledging when we're using it instead of this sort of murky world that we're in right now where we don't know if something is or is not. Um, I, I, I applaud um, the work and I think it's a nice comment on our district that it's something that's being talked about, looked at, reviewed, and and open for dialogue. I mean, this is we've been, we've been having these discussions about technology for years for now, right? And the recognition of you know fear what you don't know um, rather than embrace it. It's the how technology really has become an extension of cognition. Um, and we know kind of the just say no model in terms of drugs didn't work, and that the more we say no to something or that we really shouldn't the more that there's going to be the temptation for it right so i think getting ahead of this like you're doing is um is the right thing to do and you know inviting dialogue and form particularly from the community too like there's there's a good amount of minds in our community alone um that are involved in ai right that could be informing it um you know it's, it's it could be another feather in the hat of our district uh ryan I'm not too familiar with AI. It's obviously taking over society at kind of <laughs> extremely fast rate. Um, are there enough studies or knowledge out there to prove that this is the best path forward? I mean, on everything new, it takes time to have studies to show that it's actually helpful and that our kids connect to it and benefit from it. Or are we just trying to stay ahead of the curve when the shift society's thrown at us? I, it's a great question, and, and I think my my perspective it would be a little bit of both. I mean, we know some of the risks. We know that they're we know that these models are trained on human text, and so they incorporate human biases. And so one of the big things is being able to like really teach students to critically look at the information that's coming out and assess bias, assess fact, and and be able to do that. So. So that's one of the things where we do know. We do know that that is something that we have to work on. And part of the reason our educators want to is they want to be able to engage students in that in that type of conversation. Um, but I think you're right. I think there is a lot that we don't know yet. Um, there are are some big tools. The tool that Google produces says that students you know, under the age of 18 are not allowed to use it. So we would not allow them to use um, things under the age of 18. Um, so we're really kind of following what the terms of service are and what these companies are saying for their allowing their usage. And we're going to have to continually look at it and see whether this is the right choice and, and, and see if it's all right. Do you know why Google will allow other I don't. Yeah, I don't know. Okay. Ben was next and then Elliot. Yeah, um, just picking up on Adam, um, I, I have a little exposure to it. I'm, I work for a big technology company. I'm looking at my work computer right now with Microsoft Copilot being installed, right? We all got to opt into it this week for training on it. There's a lot of people talking about this and developing advocates around it. It's very similar to our social media policy. Instead of putting this on the shoulders of our staff, I would suggest that as a board, we take this up and maybe do some I read the volunteer you. <laughs> but similarly, right, look at kind of what's at stake, um, have a recent dialogue and come up with the standards. I'll give you a couple of instances. Like, um, so one of the great things that this technology can be used for is just taking meeting notes, right? Like you can fire up your our Microsoft Teams at the end of just a session where there's, you know, a dozen people talking in the meeting. <laughs> <laughs> It, it provides like a 95% like accurate transcript that someone just has to then check. But one of the ethics around that is um, to, to not use it to record the kind of emotion or sentiment of somebody because it could potentially pick up on somebody being angry or um, expressing you know something along those lines that might not reflect well, well upon them or accurately. Right. So that's just something that people who are thinking about how these things play out in real life, um, you know, um, they kind of incorporate that with the rules of the road. Another one is what you've already talked about, transparency. I work for a company that serves clients. And so being transparent, if we produce work product that is, you know, um, assisted by AI, right? So similarly, if a student is using it, you want to disclose to the teacher the little playing fields level. But I, I would encourage you to, you know, us as a board to put this on the on the list of things that we develop policies about. So I just wondered um 
my uh, um, exposure to some kids in college were um, basically at, at the beginning of the class, I was auditing the class, and they were given instructions that you can use AI for, you know, to give you feedback on your thoughts, to give you some organization of your thoughts, but you can't use it to write your paper, and you must uh, acknowledge it as well. And so it is being already, you know, I think that just an example, I'm sure all the classes are are doing that. You know, have to that. So I think we we do have to give some guidelines. Yeah, and, and right now our this is sort of so the way this started was we were looking at our student handbook and we're looking at sort of the plagiarism section and we're trying to figure out how to fit sort of AI. And it, it's really tough. And there's all these new questions, there's all these new pieces. And as much as there is guidance for students, there's also guidance for educators. Um, and, and interestingly, that ended up being the section as we were drafting this, where there's more. Um, so yes, and, and one of the recommendations that's becoming a little bit of a national model is for, for teachers who are using AI in their classes to say, these are the things that it is allowed to be used for on this particular side, and to be really clear in communicating that. Um, so that that's part of the recommendations that, that we're doing. Part of it also will be whether they can be where you can stay ahead of a, a watermark to be able to check for it, and the technology may not be able to stay ahead of it, but probably need to be able to slow. Um, Could we ask our students that's what they think? I, I see you two think, and I wonder. Let's see, our teachers are banned, I think. This holiday. Yeah, I mean, as, at the moment, they're like, no AI, no, because there's not, I mean, there's not enough like made guidance around it like it's not like you know like this is all new like, and so it, having the like i mean some teachers i know like um like andy smith uh you know computer science focused teachers are like go for it like i mean of course you know the attributions and you know you still have to you know cite your sources it's very good at coding yeah exactly <laughs> like coding, coding it's teachers, it's yeah. Coding. yeah very open to that kind of like usage of that i know i was using that um and when I did take a class with him, but kind of as like inspiration to come up with ideas for a project, um, just kind of neat. So I think that there are a lot of good uses for it, but a lot of teachers aren't really like open to it yet because it's not like guidelines with it, especially English teachers. I think are very kind of opposed. Yeah. Although I, I think ChatGPT could be to English what a graphing calculator is to math, you know? So <laughs> I, I think it's a tool and if it's going to be ubiquitous, which it is, and it already is, and it will be more more and more popular. Uh, I think it's smart to get ahead of it. And, and if kids are going to use it, it's going to get easier to use. Uh, there should be framework. So I think it's a smart. I want to thank Louis Spangio, Amy Smith, and Lauren Sullivan Justin who've been helping me provide feedback on this. Um, and, and it's been really, really helpful to have their, their thoughts on I guess we kind of work here. Um, but yes. Mr. Andy Smith uh, reached out early on. He's like, I didn't check in my classes. No. <laughs> no, we, we want to provide some good guidance. For, for humor, I recommend people check out the Saturday Night Live sketch with the uh, Alexa sketch. There's a bunch of senior citizens. <laughs> <laughs> so we're in my living room. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Rep. Thank you. Now, will there be a, a separate checkbox for permission when the Skynet overlords come out? <laughs> Expecting that anytime soon. All right, um, Shana, what's up next? I have to say, I love Owen's analogy. It's the TI 84 graphic calculator. <laughs> I'm a math person. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> um, I'm Shana Kalinsky, the Director of Student Support Services. And in addition to all the the day to day things going on with students, I've been deeply immersed with the support of many people on the team of interviewing and interviewing and interviewing and hiring for not only a few positions that are still open for this year with some paraeducators, but also for all the summer positions and for next year simultaneously. Um, so that has been a huge undertaking, but I wanted to um, add a couple of things when we're looking at the potential candidates, in addition to the mathematics and the literacy expertise that we're hoping people have, it, to respond to some of the comments and conversations that I hear, we're also looking for people that have strong executive functioning uh, capacity to work with students on doing school and doing life skills to be you know, a functioning human being in society. We're also looking for educators 
who have a strong focus on social emotional health and social emotional learning, because that goes hand in hand with being successful in school. And we're also looking for people who don't shy away from uh, embracing students who are having behavior challenges and then working with the many, many people uh, in, in, our, in all of our schools, such as social emotional coaches, the counselors, the school psychologists, the nurses, the paraeducators, the BCBAs, those are board certified behavior analysts who aren't just telling our educators what to do, but helping them analyze and interpret data, be reflective with that data to make learning plans for students to have a path for success. But they're also helping train our staff who might not know all the things about that particular topic to build their capacity in each of the buildings with our students as well. Uh, we've had some visits from MTSS, that's multiple tiers of systems of support. That's the fancy name for intervention. And we participated in an MTSS statewide um, learning cohort that was facilitated by Audrey Richardson. And we partner with many of these people across the state. And th these two schools came to visit us and they went around to our various buildings. What are you doing? How's it going? Um, and we had some really good things to share with them. And we're really proud to reflect on our own learning, which we didn't often think. Uh, you know, how far we came, how far we come in such a short, short amount of time. Um, we have also been spending time in the department speaking with team members, reflecting on what has gone well, what can we do better uh, to improve for next year, and then thinking about designing opportunities for our teams in MTSS and intervention and special education to really strategize and use people's superpowers to the utmost but also learn uh, new strategies and support people in their new uh, in their new learning as well. Any, Thank you. Any questions for Shana? Okay. Thank you very much. Um, is the director of CIA so genesic? Okay. We have neurovirus through our buildings, and it's yeah. treating all people differently. And certain people could see Maggie like, from the living. Uh, it's been tough. So yeah. Jen. Maggie's back. Uh, Jen's not sick, We're and you can just. Now. Yeah. 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 Don't go to that list. So you'll see uh, updates from Jen around a professional development that's wrapping up. Our late state Wednesdays, um, teachers presented on what the work they were doing around equity, as well as we are, our students are in full test mode. They're wrapping up their cognitive testing, and AP started today. Yeah. yeah. So if you see. High school students just driving in sweatpants and t-shirts is because they are when you're, making their way through AP testing. So mine's um we had our first today this morning. Yeah. Playing is Tuesday, right? Playing is Tuesday. I have Cal tomorrow on day. Oh. Yeah. Or tomorrow. No, like next week. Okay. okay. Yeah. Then I have Cal on Monday. So. Good luck. Yeah. Well, you know, and more than 40% of our students at the high school are in a enrolled in AP classes. Um, so this is a very tired group that we are supporting, and it's exciting. I mean, the number of IEP offers that our students are able to access and who enroll in them is pretty powerful. Um, but these two weeks are their finals week, and they're in training. So it's we're there for lots of sugar and don't do caffeine. So that's Jen's update. So I pass it over to our director of finance and operations. So it's never dull in this office. Um, some good news is the state, after 18 months of arguing with public schools, has agreed to move forward with them, signed a contract through 2027, which means our software, our time software, is, is not a budget expense for us until after 2027. Uh, the release that came out in March of 23 will finally be available to us in July of 24. And we'll move to the new platform, which will be lots of enhancements that my team is dying to get their hands on. Um, our electric buses are plugged in and charging. And the next thing, and we haven't said we're, we're still trying to schedule, is the training on how to use the chargers, how to use the buses. And I keep telling you they're going to be on the road. They will be, I promise, before the end of the school year, <laughs> but it may only be one week, but they will be out there. 
Um, I'll, I'll, I'll make them use them this summer for um, so, summer sec. Yeah, there you go. Um, just want to give you an update. Our gifts, grants, and other things that Rhiannon and team, and it's you know Rhiannon's the coordinator, but it's the teachers and principals. A lot of people working here together have brought in over forty one thousand dollars this year. So. You know, I'm, I'm pushing. We've got about seven weeks left. I'd love to see her break a half million. I don't think we will this year, but I'm pushing. Um, through the end of um, March, which is the report that I put up um, to through February, we were 50% spent on the budget. Um, the only variance in the month of February was Joe and I sat down and we. Uh, reallocated his budget so every single one of Joe's budgets got adjusted to recognize the fact that he had a problem here and not there and as we move money back and forth between his different buildings to make his budgets um, available and work for the rest of the year. At the end of February we still had 14 and percent of the budget that was not committed which is good. Uh, we're really embracing and using the purchase order system Encumbering things as we should, and um, we're doing a good job managing the budget. Um, that's about it. Any questions for Jim? All right, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. uh, now, our student board members. First. All right. Um, so, yeah, um, as Sherry was saying, cognitive testing and AP exams are. Have, well, cognitive testing is kind of on the back end. I think that most students have uh, been finished with that, but AP exams started today. Um, I know Owen and I had um, uh, very first exam AP Gov. We had that in the morning, and that went pretty well for students. But um, yeah, high school students for the next two weeks are going to be dragging around uh, the campus. So um, I know I'm already I'm already starting to like, you know, dragging out of that uh, test room, but. You know, I think a lot of students have prepared all year for this, and teachers have been amazing with um, giving students resources to, um, you know, prepare for these very, like, big um, kind of medicine exams and make the, you know, stress of them um, as light as can be. Um, so we thank the teachers and the support system that students have these exams, and we wish the students the best of luck as they tackle these exams in the next two weeks and just kind of finish out the year strong. I know there's a lot, of, there's been a lot of events recently um, in the high school and middle school that have kind of um, brought up student morale. Um, I know on Thursday, April 18th, mm -hmm. I wasn't here for this, but um, students and teachers participated in this two, um, in two school-wide workshops. One was meant for the middle schoolers and one was meant for the high schoolers. Um, and this was led by the Dance Theater of Harlem. And so these workshops were kind of centered around their work um, about kind of fostering community and peer work through dance. And it offered an amazing experience for um, the student body and all of those who participated. Um, students also partook in um, Earth Day workshops, centered around learning about how to take care of the environment and different um, you know skills and actions we can take to take care of our community and the broader community around the globe. Um, students practiced stewardship um, skills and worked um, together on projects um, to promote sustainability and care for the environment. Um, and then kind of the last one, another big event that happened over the past month was um, there's two exchange trips that took place. Um, one was to France, um, which occurred first, and then a week, about a week after, um, another group went to Spain. Um, and each trip was about a week and a half, I think around 10 days. Um, students were able to immerse themselves in the culture they've been studying for. A lot of them have been studying since middle school, some just through high school or just for a few years. Um, and they were able to make connections with people who lived in those countries and had firsthand experience uh, with those cultures. And all these events collectively have helped keep student life positive despite all the stress of these upcoming exams and just that of the year. Um, yeah. Yeah, so 270 of our 450 students are doing a sport right now. So that's 60%, um, pretty awesome. Usually fall is our biggest, I talked to, um, Jack Warner the other day. So he said fall is usually somewhere around 70%, but this is a pretty big um, spring season for us. So I thought that was interesting. Um, this month, freshmen, sophomores, and juniors will run for leadership positions uh, uh, elected by their peers. So that's student council and class officers. Um, 
So also the school year's last all school meeting will happen. It's going to set off the senior class um, and also prom for upper class when we'll be at the Killington Grand on the 19th. Thanks to Jane Stout for planning everything. Um, <laughs> this week, uh, the theater program performed the Women of Lockerbie. Uh, the art department is, I think, now also holding uh, an exhibition of student art. Um, or maybe it just ended, but but uh, I heard it was great. Um, and uh, AP exams kicked off this morning and this afternoon uh, for, for the students taking them. We covered one test per annum per student, um, which is a great opportunity. Uh, and cognitive testing, I think, remains a bit of a challenge for students uh, on the on the consumer end. Uh, it can be a little clunky, but I want to thank Raph and Jen and the whole faculty and staff team um, and, and everyone who works hard to, to make those as seamless as possible. Um, and also just recently, I didn't write it down, but um, the student council is going to be working. And I'm sorry, I'm going to I'm going to butcher her name, but is it Mariki Russo? Marike? Marike. 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 Yeah. Okay. There we go. But uh, we're going to be doing an augmentative adaptive communication cafe. So we'll be working with high school students who use um, alternative forms of communication like technology assisted communication um, and meeting with them, I think, on a monthly or bi weekly basis, having conversations with them and learning to use that technology too. So uh, I thought that was a cool program. That's it. All right. Any questions for Aiden and Owen? Thank you, as always. All right, we are now going to move into our appointments. The first one is Niask presentation by Mr. Smale. I'm going to go back. Great, there's something on the, on the screen, right, right now. Okay. Oh, right, good. Um, thanks. It's good to be here tonight. Um, this this report is a summary of, of 10 years of work, 10 years of work that Touch Dues, both Aiden and uh, Owen, helped do tours around the Niask accreditation visit. And I would say it touches every single person in the school that really is in this place. So I want to take you through around what is the report, what does it mean, and then what are some of the findings in it as well. So go ahead, Rita, next slide, please. So the first one is like, what's the value of it? So we understand like uh, to have accreditation is a seal of approval, right? And so for us, the accreditation seal is on our transcripts. It's on our school profile. It's on the website. It's a another level of kind of assurance of our program. And so both the value of doing that, the process is really strong for us, but also having that mark is really, it's meaningful. Uh, NEASC, it does all the schools in New England. It does most international private schools and a fair amount of private schools as well. So it's really a no entity. Great. So as far as the standard type of work, so I have a few things that I think are, are important here. And one is to look at the standards as a template, a template about how do you shape it and personalize it in some ways? And throughout the process, I'll show this to you, it gets increasingly personalized about the school, meaning here, here are some broad standards that are good across schools, but how do we really hone those in to be about what is good for us when we work on? And then the bottom piece here again, so what does it mean? So to be accredited means that we've gone, we've met the standards and they've the level, but also there's this commitment to an ongoing improvement process. We're gonna maintain those standards and keep moving forward. Thanks, so the standards are in five large buckets, and then within those, there are over 30 kind of like principles of effective practice. We can just kind of see a standard one through five, and I'll do a little bit more details as we go. go ahead. So as I was saying, so as far as like our process, so um, our high school's been accredited with NIA since 1956. But this is our first go with this new process. So they just updated it, I think, in 2015. So this last go is this new for uh, ongoing 10-year recycle. It used to be more about kind of like an event, kind of a 10-year event. So here are the components we've done. So the first was, and we did this self-reflection completed in 2020. So this one, the school looks at all of the standards and all of the substandards and reflects on each one to what degree you're meeting the standard and provide evidence to support it. So that's like the large report. Then a visiting team came. So the squad of conference comes, and their job is to look at that report and verify it, change it, um, what makes work going, what do you do going forward? And so we had that conference that was in 21. And then from that, 
uh, identifies what are some key priority areas for growth? What are the places you want to focus on in the school? Because another part of this process is what's your capacity for growth? Are you a growing institution or a stack? And this is thing to keep the school growing. So we are, we made our summary of that, and then we just posted this dissenting official. So this is a group of I think it's seven total um, teachers administrators, apparently mostly from Vermont, um, Connecticut as well. And their job is to look at that report and see how are we doing, make some recommendations going forward. Next, please. Uh, a little bit on the methodology. You got the gist of it. This kind of inquiry method about how we have this back and forth process and to align those standards. But also the reason I highlighted it is there's also this place of when accommodations recommendation. So what are some things that are really places where you know if you focus on these areas, you're going to see some improvement. These are the places to go. Next. So the framework for the decennial visit um, in the again the bolded areas one. Are you growing those priority areas? So you set those priority areas in 21, coming back about two and a half years later. Uh, was the school able to make progress and growth in those areas? How are you aligning these foundational elements? And then a, a third kind of like overall with the school is how is the school as a learning organization? And that takes these four things that are on the right. First, what's your conceptual understanding? Conceptual understanding of, of the areas of growth and how to make them happen. What's the commitment to it? Does your staff community from behind it really make these things happen? Confidence, do you not do it? And capacity, resources, those sorts of things behind. So the first standard, standard learning culture, all these are the same way where I just gave a few accommodations, so you can see those, and then just a, an overall rating. So the first one, uh, learning culture, we've got all the foundation elements. Uh, these are some of the things that were noted about our school's learning and cult culture. One thing that stood out, uh, there were the surveys. They did surveys of all the students. Um, this is again back in 2020, 21. All the students, community members, and uh, our faculty and the reviewers said that our school had the highest number of students who said they were connecting with an adult of any place they'd seen. They were hitting kind of like 85, 90%. So, really, a hallmark of, I'd say, the intimate place that the school is. Next, please, Randall. Right Second one, uh, student learning again. All of our foundational elements met. Some of the things that were said. One that really came out, I think we've heard a lot tonight from a variety of people, is about the diversity of programming. I mean, that's the thing that really stands out. I think you look at a, a small school that does a lot of things. Um, from as this says, crafts, C3, theater, world languages, AP programs. Um, so really seeing a school of this size kind of doing things beyond this expected capacity. Next. So within the this standard, the second standard, we did identify two priority areas for growth. First one is to look at how are we making the portrait of a graduate, how are we bring that into action in the classrooms. So visiting teams, again, the reviews are really impressed with the way we developed it, as far as the number of people are involved in it, seeing the beginning about um, starting to make some administrative views on rubrics, but not really seeing it from the classrooms much. So some recommended next steps to get the POG actualized in the classroom a little bit more. So some choices there. Next, another priority area that was within this the standard was around the written curriculum. And when we had the Claremont conference visit, we actually weren't meeting the standard. We didn't have a written curriculum that was a consistent format across the core classes. Teachers have worked really hard for the past three years, and now we met that standard to really, and that's been the one that's been kind of a bugaboo in the school for years to sort of really dig into that and make that happen. And so pretty excited about that. Still a priority area, we'll hold on to it. Still want to complete that mapping. Think about how do you revise it? What's that revision cycle? How are we moving forward? Um, so there'll be a total of four priority areas. So one, okay, how are we making that POG in the classrooms and then this written curriculum. Next, please, Brandon. Third standard professional practice. Again, all foundational elements were met. Kind of a, about the, the spirit of the school. Like what's the sense of, of, of how things are going about? I think as Raph said tonight, this kind of spirit of professionalism, we see like, hey, we got this AI thing. How do we dig into that and make sense of it um, for our school, for our community? Next, please. Next standard uh, learning support. Again, we met all the foundational elements, and you're going to see a lot of things in these accommodations that are pretty specific. And that's because this is another priority area where we're really looking at how can we enhance um, what we call our tier one and tier two interventions. And you've heard this a lot this year. You hear about our MPSS moves, moves and that's what this, this thing. 
But it's a really specific things here. It's really things about um, hiring interventionists. You know, we've worked with our, our SEL um, specialists, Tom Emery and, and Laurie Smith, and really pushing the school forward there, uh, an MPS coordinator. So, so those things are, are having big effects. Next, please. So again, we did see this as, we did notice this as a priority area. And I would say we made a lot of growth in those tier two interventions. So those are the ones that aren't so classroom based, a little bit more specialist at hand. Um, the recommended strategies are really around how do we get that first year practice more actualized in classrooms. Another piece where you've seen this thing too is although we're only uh, two years into it, I guess three years into it, and how we're starting to, to use that as much more of a dynamic data source to inform our practices. Okay, next one. Fifth and final standard, the resources for learner and learning. And this one, we did not meet the foundational element. And I don't think any on the board would be surprised that it was around the school site and plant um, support the delivery of curriculum programs and services is the standard that we did not meet. So it's kind of in that place. But I love this first one. I think it's a real point of pride. Uh, the quality of the staff and learning occurring for Woodstock students is a testament to the climate and culture that exists despite the balance of facility. I think that's, that's pretty, pretty important. Okay. Next one, please, Raina. So it has been a priority. Um, again, address the facilities issues with the current building, explore a new building or a renovation plan. The visiting team did take note of the HVAC improvements, the kind of the septic pump, the heating, all uh, some bathroom renovations, so all good things. I'll say like, those are things that are making the school more operational, keeping it functioning. Um, but as we all know, we're starting to do this balance of where's the tipping scale, right? Um, you can see the report was written a while ago, so this was confirmed for us in, in March, but they would say it gave us place of what to do as an alternative to the building. I know that's the board's involvement right now or it's the next steps. All right, next one. So final slide here. So as far as what are the fall responsibilities? And so again, it's an ongoing cycle. So there'll be a, a year one, year three, year six report, and then it gets back into that self-reflection cycle. Mm -hmm. And kind of the expectation you can see in the bottom there is to see that within five years that, that there's that most of those recommendations have been realized. So that, or at least a, a good thing. And any questions? Yeah, do you, do you have a sense of um, other schools in Vermont that may have uh, also failed standard five? Oh, that's a great question. No, I don't know the answer to that. I, don't, I wonder if you could find that. I don't know. There's some questions. Yeah. Kind of given the state of things. Yeah, there. right, right. No, certainly in the visiting committee, there were comments like, yeah, you got bad, they got bad too. There, there's still some comments there. Yeah, yeah they right. Thank mm -hmm. Thanks, Yeah, but the accommodation around curriculum, and so oh, I was yeah. the NIES yeah, coordinator yeah. many years ago, and yeah, yeah. and they're like, where are your curriculum? And the binders came yeah. off, and the dust was dusted off. So yeah. great work for the high school, middle school faculty, and middle school was part of this. Oh, thanks for that. Yeah. Yes, because that never happened before. Yeah, thanks for that, Sherry. So the the way it works in NIES is it's the level of the, the principal, and since the board made it to one principal of that building, that shifted our, our NIES, and so our first. Middle school accreditation is 2001. Good work. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. All right. Next up, we have Melissa to talk to us about Byron Academy Spring Travel. Hello. Um, this is really informational for you all to be aware that. At Barnard Academy, there's been a long history of doing overnight field trips and to really build out of the classroom experiences for our students. Um, there's been uh, quite a few years now that we have not done those starting uh, when it closed down for the pandemic. So this year, we have two overnight field trips, one that we just had at the end of April. We went to Great Barrington, Massachusetts, uh, to a place called Nature's Classroom. And the students spent a lot of time outdoors, worked with the staff there, focused on the environment and stewardship and science and learning. It was really fun. We had a wonderful trip. Um, the next field trip is coming up the beginning of June, and we're going to go to Washington, D.C., and it's connected to um, our human rights studies and see uh, a lot of um, 
very famous places and history, and we're really excited about that as well. So I wanted to bring that to your attention and um, point them. Thank you. How long is that bus ride to DC? How long is it? Oh, ride? how long is it? Uh, Ten hours. Tell you right now. I don't think it's not very much, but yeah, I think it's most of the day. We have to leave at six in the morning. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. I don't. I don't envy. I don't envy those. Uh, <laughs> it's in a bus for ten plus hours. Yeah, with five, six, 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 six. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Um, Sherry's going to present a, a little bit about the culture survey. Yes. Data that that I gather. There we go. All right. So, um, as many of you know, oh, this is interesting. Where is it? What? Stop there. Where'd it go? Hang on. Let's try that again. There it is. Now we're going to share. Ah, it's very strange. All right. So we're going to start with questions. We're going to go right back. You didn't see anything. And here we go. So, um, as many of you know, who are parents or educators in this district, that we did our second climate survey. Um, and so I wanted to give an overview of results, just attending to those top five areas for agreement and those lowest areas of agreement. So we're going to walk through this. Um, as a reminder, so I'm going to go over what the process is, what the summary of findings, and where we go from that with our Quaglia data. Um, how we started here, I'm just going to hang on a second so you can see. Um, we, part of the uh, previous strategic plan was to begin to do a culture survey, something we hadn't done before, and so this is the second year um, to address that strategic plan goal. Um, we looked at a, a number of different culture surveys and we landed on Quaglia because their eight conditions that they assess are really in line with our portrait of a graduate. Um, it also includes our students in terms of their perceptions of the situation, as well as their role in learning and engagement. So really it measures both those factors. And those same themes are mirrored in our teacher survey and our parent survey. So of all the different data we looked at, mm -hmm. as well as giving us some national data and some local data. So that's how we landed with Quaglia. So the first one was student voice grades three through five. We had 171 students responding. Those areas they agreed with the most were that that my teacher cares about me, and you'll see this spring and nationally, because it's third graders, there wasn't data from last year, so we only have two columns. The other ones you'll see three columns. So the areas that they rated the highest were my teacher cares about me. It's important to follow rules. Teachers respect students. I give my best effort at school, and my teacher helps me learn from my mistakes. And you can see they're pretty closely aligned with the national scores for that age group. The five areas they agreed with the least was that I give up when school is difficult, school is boring, I see myself as a leader, my teacher hangs up my work in the classroom the hallway, I'm going to say the fire department helps with that one, but I'm just <laughs> saying that's my fat side agreement. Um, and I think bullying is a problem in my school. So of all the areas that they responded to, I think there's about 60, 30, 30 different things. It's a long checklist. Um, those are the things they agreed with the least. Um, and again, interesting to see these are our third through fifth graders, their perceptions of what their experience is like in their schools. Students grade six through 12, and then they chunk it in those two groups. And again, about three, almost 300 students responding. What they agreed with the most, my parents care about my education. I believe I can be successful. It's my responsibility to make sure I am learning. I know what I need to do to be successful in my classes. And I think it's important to set high goals. Again, these were the top five in agreement. <laughs> um, and you can see where they were last year, this group of six through 12, and where they are nationally. In terms of what they agreed with the least, I have never been recognized for something positive at school. I have difficulty fitting in at school. I find homework helpful to my overall learning. 
<laughs> I'm afraid to try something I think I may fail and other students see me as a leader. Something that we're really thinking about, being more intentional on, on providing more leadership opportunities for all our students starting early on, elementary and going through <laughs> secondary, um, part of our leadership summit, where are the places where our students learn how to be a leader? So that's something we've been attending to. And um, while it dropped from last year, again, something that um, we value in our district. Parent voices, three to three to twelve, two 210. I will say the national database and wrap brought this to my attention. They have very few parents in the national portion. So the national data, but we can make comparisons from this year and last year. So parents rated highest. I care of my child's education. I support my child when they are trying new things. I encourage my child to ask questions when they are curious. Learning can be fun. And I encourage my child to make decisions. What they agreed to the least is my child gives up when schoolwork is difficult. My child has difficult fitting in at school. Um, my child is bored at school. My child is afraid to try something if, I might, if it may result in failure. I know the goals my child's school is working on this year, so that is interesting. How do we make sure parents are really aware of what those overall goals are? And then with regards to our teacher voice, um, Teachers who graded most highly, learning can be fun. I believe that can be successful. I actively engage, I actively encourage students to practice good citizenship. I have a colleague at school who has positive role model for me. I enjoy learning new things and I respect my students. What they agree with the least is that I'm concerned my colleagues, my colleagues will resent me if I am too successful. I am afraid to try something I, if I think I might fail. I have never been recognized for something positive of school. I think bullying is a problem at my school and central office understands the unique culture of our school. Maybe around finances, I just told you. <laughs> um, so our next steps, we presented all the data to each of the principals by their school. So they're the only ones that have seen it by school. Um, and they met with a central office partner to review it. Uh, principals brought back the data to their schools to identify action steps. And so at our leadership team this Thursday, the principals will present their actions that they will be taking based on the data they received on their individual school. Any questions? Our lease survey is like confidential and you can get a little bit of them too. I was just curious on one of the last slides where there's two and a half percent of our teachers that don't respect their students. I, I kind of expected that to be 100 percent of the ones in the spring of 2023. Mm -hmm. So I'm just kind of curious on which teachers are not respecting our students. But just it's that. confidential. So yeah, I don't shock her. Um, I don't yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 Though it is up from last year. <laughs> Can the board can the board get access to all the data as opposed to the summary? Can we just see like the full? So we've really been careful. We the the caution we have about that is comparing one school against another school. So each has its unique strengths and weaknesses, and so we really why we collapse the data for this presentation. Some schools only have forty students. Some have two hundred. There are unique compositions in each building, so we really try to stay away from comparing one school versus another. I think that's just something I'm not really comfortable with. The board should have a right to compare schools one to another. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Totally. I agree. Yeah. Anyway, so, I mean, this is a public meeting, but can you share it confidentially with the board members? Yeah. Yeah, I what we can do is maybe we can put, um, Dave Rath and I presented the data in different ways. The, each report is about 20 pages long. So we can collapse the data if that's what you want. I, and I will, it's really important that we keep it unique to the board. I just, it's a dynamic with faculty and- I'll like, sign a confidentiality agreement. No, no, I just want, and yeah. want to be careful about that. And I, I have to take all 20 things because I don't need it to collapse. Well, a lot of it's really repetitive stuff, like in terms of what are the attributes. It's not content specific to our district, it's content specific to the survey. So you, we can give it to you. Other questions on the data?
All right. Thank you, Sherry. Interesting. So we do have a resignation, um, and that is Alyssa McDonough from the WHSMS What Health and Phys Ed program. Um, she's a great person. I taught with her right down the hall from her when she was in middle school, and um, she brought a lot of, um, I think, some positive wellness um, programs to our school and worked with several teams and um, has been a key person. And so I think you, you said that she's leaving because to be closer to family, which is a worthy reason for leaving, um, but she'll be missed, I'm sure. And Karen wants to say any more than that. Yeah, thanks, Gary. I guess what I'd add to is so uh, it was, it was 10 years, is that right? I think so. He was a seventh grade teacher and then a ninth grade teacher. And her lasting impact was really this combined wellness program to kind of combine um, PE and health into this, this class and really put it at like, it's in a high standing, right? Kind of like you see it as a really vital part of the program. So that's a lasting piece of her. So um, lots of effects here. Also, she was a soccer coach, snowboarding coach. Softball, I think, at times, so mm -hmm. in lots of places. So, big presence, great, great part of the Thanks. So, is there a motion to accept the resignation? Second. Second. Did I hear second? Sure. All right. All right. We accept that resignation with regret. Um, and we have a number of new hires. I think we can probably vote them as a slate. Yes. Um, so we can see here that there's various positions, and I know you've been working hard on getting all those positions filled. Um, so is there a motion to uh, accept all of these, approve all of these uh, new staff members? I'm you to accept these staff members as listed. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. All in favor? Aye. 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 I think I might have forgotten to have a vote on the resignation. Did I? Yeah. yeah. All right. Um, I, I think we're also moving forward, if I'm correct, this way, with authorization for you to approve. Yeah, that's the that's next, the next oh. item. Oh, sorry. Okay. All right, Sherry, do you want to speak to that? So we are in full hiring mode. Um, many districts are now requiring contracts to be signed. And so um, those who have decided to move to our district need a quick answer before they have to sign their own contract. So typically between this board meeting and when we return in September, the board chair and vice chair have authorization to approve hires. Because the next time we get together is June, which is really too late for many who would need to sign a contract. Okay. So uh, we need a motion to grant the chair and the vice chair. Uh, what's the point of the new hire committee in general? Like, it, we're going to grant permission or power to just one person for the hiring. I don't want to derail or slow down any of the hiring process because I understand the urgency and the need. But I feel like there's two new members to the new hire retention and <clears throat> what else the rest of that committee. Uh, appointed two months ago, and then to join you, Carrie. And by doing this, that eliminates the two people that just joined that, and all just you. So I'm, I'm just lost on what the responsibility is of the new hiring committee. If uh, we don't have anything, I'm not, I, are you talking about the negotiations committee? Yeah, okay, that's just for negotiations. I don't, we don't have a hiring committee, it do we? It says new yeah. hire again. You eliminated that in March. Shit. Carry <laughs> <laughs> on. <laughs> yes, I guess we did. That's a good question. <laughs> Thank you for remembering that, right? Um, all right. Is there a motion to grant the chair the and the vice chair the authority to approve new hires through July? So moved. This is Anna. I was going to say, I think Ryan was moved. I will second. No, Ryan, Ryan. No, I, was, I was just delayed on asking more questions. I'm sorry. Oh. So, uh, I received. Who's in charge of the hires currently? If we're asking just the chair 
and vice chair to have the power to continue. So basically, the the um, superintendent principals are making those decisions and bringing forward the names to us as a board, and that's what we just voted in a group of people that have been um, given to us through the administration. So they, they will continue to do that work. We yeah. don't we don't work at that level. We oh. just we just say yes. Thank you. Sorry. <laughs> I make a motion. No problem. All right, Ryan's made the motion and Anna has seconded it. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, very good. Thank you. Can I ask a question? Sure. Um, what's the MTSS coordinator position? Is that that's a teaching position or is that the that's a um Karen, do you want to speak to your position? Or Arana, do you want to speak yeah, to Aaron, you, you, you were talking about happy tech. I was replacing Audrey Richardson, uh, who is an integral role for all the systems at the school, uh, but it's a, a teaching position. Okay. It, it was, um, and we posted it in a way that allows the flexibility to cast a really broad net, so really the best person for the job, but had the potential to perhaps be something other than teaching, uh, but the teaching position uh, moving forward with this hire. Coordinating testing, looking at the systems of support, looking at data use throughout the building. Yes, yeah, there's some 504 coordination mm -hmm. as well. MTSS, uh, all the tiers, the tier one, two, three that you saw in the 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 in the, the, yeah. the, in the yes, thank you uh, accreditation is also noted there as well. So it's really important uh, that we have someone in that position. There's a lot to have lots of different pieces, and they all really speak to each other. So it's really about an ecosystem of <laughs> data and having somebody with their hands on that all the time. Just to clarify, it's a very broad job description from the sounds, like pretty much everything. Yeah, okay. it, it's, it's it's a pretty heavy job, yeah, but um, it's specific to um, the 504s, um, the, inter the interventions of students that qualify or don't qualify for any levels of support that are outside of a tier one general education setting. Um, but it is so there's all that coordination, but it also historically helps um, with um, some of these a AP, AP testing, the cognia. Um, there's a lot of behind the scenes work that goes into organizing that, communicating with teachers, scheduling, um, all of that as well. So all those things combined, um, certainly a, a full time job, um, do it really well. It's also really the center of the educational system, this TSS. Uh, multi tiered systems of support. So, we really want a tight MPSS model and system because all the resources that you approve that your communities support um, all come in and out of that, that model. Good question. Can I ask a question on this? Um, if a teacher transfers position, we don't see a resignation from the current position. And if they get hired into a new position, we don't approve the new position. Is that right? Correct. Right. right. So if someone's assuming a new responsibility within the contract, yeah. So a teacher moves from a third or pre K, there's movement within the district that is not authorized through the board. All right. Include like promotions, like you move up position from your, is that still something that's done at your level? So if someone moves from a, a teacher contract to an administrative contract? Yes, or, or something of that nature where you go from a teacher to a principal or something like that. Like, is that approved by you or is that just kind of curious how that works? Yeah, it's an interview, an application process, and it would still be brought to here because you're okay. leaving the contract and your administrators operate outside the contract. Thank you. Thank you. And we license it here. Mm -hmm. All right, um, now we're into the uh, committees and working groups. Finance committee. No report to the board. Nice. Okay. <laughs> policy committee. So we have uh, three policies bring up. We have been brought up prior. We have uh, two for adoption that have been heard twice so far. There's been no changes on either of um, those policies since the last time. So um, I would like to ask for a motion for um, the local wellness policy and the fiscal management and financial accountability to be um, adopted at this point. I just want to mention that F20 also should include an elimination of F21 because F21 is reporting. And as we've mentioned before, so if we adopt F20, we should get rid of our current F21. 
Okay, we need a motion. So moved. Second. All right. All in favor of these policies being voted through? Please say aye. 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 Any opposed? And the um, <clears throat> one for a second read is uh, our capitalization of assets. We've talked about this as well. And this is something that um, just a protocol for auditing and reporting, appreciating capital assets. And um, I would just like to make a motion to approve this for adoption next month. So this is a, this is the second read. Yep. Any questions on that, Ozzy? Second. Okay. Did you move it? Do we need a motion for that? Mm -hmm. uh, yes. I, then I move to move this to adoption on next meeting. Right. And I'll second. Okay. Anyone have any questions on that policy? All right. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you very much. Thank you, Elliot. Thank you. you guys do a lot of work. <laughs> All right. Buildings and grounds. Um, yeah, we did meet. We met uh, down at Reading Elementary School. Um, so now we've had a meeting in each of the, I think, seven campuses altogether. Um, and I'm really impressed with that building. Uh, really, really good shape. Paint job is great. Um, uh, so, and I would say the same for each of the campuses that we visited. And we'll continue that rotation going around to the different buildings when we meet. Um, so the hot topic, uh, no pun intended, is the Temp the heat control system by JCI and whether they would hit the May 1st deadline. There have been talks about whether we would let them go as a contractor if they can't perform there close to two years late. Did they hit May 1? Yeah, so I can give you a little update on that. So, yeah, JCI has indicated that they completed the project. Uh, Jim and I are going to meet with them hopefully by the end of the week. Um, I have a punch list, of course, they have a punch list. And we'll start punching each other. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, that would that'd be a great outcome. I'm still hearing about the classrooms that hit 90 plus degrees during the day. Um, I, not since maybe they finished their work. But, yeah. uh, We're still working through books. Um, we did uh, respond to a request to to look into whether we could put in. A uh, school speed limit zone in front of the middle school, high school. Uh, remarkably, we don't have one. Uh, all all the other buildings do. Um, like the Cross the Valley School, when when you're dropping your kids off or picking them up, there's little lights flashing telling you to reduce your speed to 25. Um, we as a committee recommended that for the middle school, high school. Thought it would be a good idea to drop from 35 to 25 just during hours during drop off and pickup. And so that will be. The state, Vermont Trans, will we'll look into that. We'll work with our uh, two rivers. Two rivers out of Quichi. Two rivers out of Quichi. Um, but they also asked whether we would look into traffic lights and a crosswalk. And we, we were a little cautious on that, just thinking about what traffic might back up if we had a, an actual turn signal in front of the middle school, high school. But nonetheless, we're going to continue to like work with the rivers out of Quichi to determine whether it's possible, starting with the crosswalk. Um, and this came out of the Parent Advisory Council. Yeah. And the concern is that a number of students live on the other side of Group 4. And even after school, theater, that kind of stuff. So that's where that concern came from. So so more to come. It'll take some time to work through that with Vermont Trans. But, um, our committee thought it was a good idea to reduce speed from 35 to 25. And we uh, took the request about the retractable wall at Prosper Valley School, but um, we wanted to wait and hear the parents come tonight to determine if that was really the solution that that was needed. And just to piggyback on that as well, a few things. So JCI has insinuated that they were uh, done with their project. Uh, good note on that is we're starting to see some money from Efficiency Vermont for all the improvements we've been doing to the school. It's uh, tens of thousands, not hundreds of thousands, but hopefully here, once we sign off and complete the project, we get some more uh, rebates from Efficiency uh, Vermont. Um, we're continuing to work to finish up uh, getting contractors in for our summer projects. Um, 
kind of crushed that the new hire committee is gone because I am desperate for a custodian, <laughs> a couple of them. Um, so if anyone knows, uh, if someone's looking for a great job, uh, we've been looking since February at the Woodstock Elementary, and it's just not happening. So uh, if anyone knows of anybody, please send them my way. Um, I think that was it for the lights. We did reach out to the town of Woodstock, Jim Lamnett, with Eric Duffy. A week or two ago, um, he's going to bring it up to the select board because the governing body, i.e. the town, needs to make that request to the key trans. So um, the ball is moving and it'll probably be a lot. All right, thank you very much. Uh, working groups. New build has an update. Uh, who's ready for some more PowerPoints? <laughs> Um, so this is interesting. Uh, I think it's interesting because I wrote it. But um, uh, so what were what New Build has been up to since the bond vote in, on March fifth over the last couple months? We we saw survey results, of course, uh, coming out of that massive response. Every board member gave us feedback in terms of their thoughts on the process, and we've taken that and gone back and revisited the project options. And by that I mean uh, a number of. Uh, People from the administration, our um, owners reps, uh, PCI, the construction firm, our architects, and some of the board members have gotten together to look at some of the things that were suggested in the surveys and by board members, just to kind of take a harder look at the direction. And this is just a rundown of where we are. Uh, all um, where did my there's my agenda. So uh, this is your standard Ben Ford PowerPoint presentation here. So you've got an agenda for this one. Uh, we're going to talk about. Well, why are we doing that? Uh, then what the process that we followed to date, I'm gonna revisit those 2019 project options just to kind of level set, then take a look at the options that we've developed uh, along with some pros and cons, and then talking about next steps. The too long didn't read it version of this whole thing is that over the next two times we get together, uh, the June board meeting, and uh, we'll have kind of more information from that group, uh, particularly cost information on those different options. And then at the committee meeting, we've done this a couple of times during budget season, but since we don't have a board meeting in July, the committee meeting in July, we'll get together and June, make some, June. Excuse, sorry, in June and make some, it'll be June 17th and make some decisions. Um, that is, are we going to pick an option now? Or are we going to, uh, if we need to make a decision then if we decide to go to a, a, uh, a bond vote in September. So that's where this is all kind of heading to be prepared to be able to do that if we choose to do that. So, um, Close this, sorry. Uh, purpose and goals. Um, this is a little bit of, of a busy slide, and I'm going to drain it because it's got a lot of good information that many of you have contributed to. So when we went around the table right after the bond vote at the March meeting. I think the first reason is that we all recognize that we need to address the conditions of the middle school and high school building. That's a problem that hasn't gone away, and I thought Heather put it best when she said no is still an expensive choice. Um, also to be responsive to a lot of points of feedback from the school board and community members, some of the great feedback, Matt, uh, I think you made a great point when you said that that design work that we did in 2019 became dated and detached from voters decision. We saw that come through in the surveys, people saying that uh, there wasn't enough transparency, even though I think Adam, you were frustrated that people were, were expressing that because there had been so much um, groundwork laid. Corinne talked about exploring you know, further revisions to the design, seeing what the connection points there were to identifying impacts to our school programs. Definitely want to take a look at that. Josh and Bob, among many people, talked about you know, the tax impacts just being too much. Bob talking about needing to get the project cost down. And so we're absolutely you know, taking a, a hard run at, at ways that we can do that and get it creative. So both yes and no voters talked about those concerns with um, the process, transparency, the lack of options. So that's a good reason to revisit the project options. And then um, the, the top reason, and one of the top reasons was no voters said was that renovating surely uh, could be cheaper or better than uh, building new. And so one of the things that we're tasking the construction firm with is looking at that renovation option that we had considered in 2019. I think at the time it was like a $51 million price tag and uh, refreshing the price on that and getting a better sense of what it would entail. And then one of the great ideas that came out uh, from the surveys was building a smaller building that can be added onto if more students come, uh, utilizing a phased or modular approach. And that's something, um, Josh, you were really instrumental in our sessions in, in moving the ball on that one. So 
what was the process that we followed? Uh, beginning of April, we did a building walkthrough with the groups that I talked about, the owner's reps, the construction firm, the architects, members of the school administration and board members, uh, Ryan, Josh, Carrie, me, Bob Crean, uh, all been involved at various times in this effort. And then a uh, series of weekly meetings, uh, the owner's reps each week have held, you know, kind of a series of follow-ups uh, for the last five weeks. We're meeting again tomorrow. And it's all been about just reviewing work that uh, Lee Sherwood, our architect, comes up with a new design pretty much each time and uh, we kind of look at it. And then um, PCI uh, tasks, uh, PC construction with, you know, can you price that? How much time do you need? Talking about that sort of thing. So, uh, just level setting on the 2019 project options. Um, so these, you've probably seen these slides a hundred times. These are the things that we we went through back then. Uh, this is our architects firm saying, okay, you can renovate. Here's the scoring on that against the you know, the project goals. You can you know, renovate um, and have some additions that uh, went out the window when we learned that the river corridors program wouldn't allow us to expand the footprint. So that's a dead option. And then option uh, two or the third choice was that the river school that kind of maxed out the criteria. Um, the, this is interesting. Um, this is pros and cons that we, I think we kind of blasted over in our, in our community presentations at the time. Because if you look at like the renovation option and the river school, the new build, these pros and cons are, are for the most part, completely valid still, right? Like a lot of the same, and you'll see this when I run down the pros and cons for these that we kind of refresh. But um, you know some of the considerations for why the board backed the new build option in the first place. Um, this was the costs in 2019, right? Some are, excuse me. This is the um, utility cost, um, just the operating costs uh, annually, and then what back then was the price tag for each of those options. That was that you know high end 51 million for renovation, as compared to you know 67 million for the the new building. Um, that came in, as we all know, close to double that price, and we had to value engineer it back down to, to $99 million. So what, um, what options are we looking at? This is just the kind of the site plan of the, um, the what went to the voters in March. But what we came up with were, were three options. This is revisiting that renovate option. That's that same picture from 2019 and kind of lock that in here. Um, and what are the pros and cons? Um, I want to just throw out a disclaimer here that these number ranges here are completely, um, you know, wild guesses on my part, and these have not been backed by anything that the PC construction has come up with, but this is kind of an anticipated why we think it's worth doing, right, um, in looking at these options. So renovating, if you take that $51 million price tag and you, excuse me, and you, um, uh, you know, inflate it to the same degree that the, uh, the new build option got inflated, you're probably looking at something in that $75, $85 million price range. Um, so it's potentially cheaper than building new. You got the ability, one of the things that came through in the feedback was you, you tear down a building and you put the whole thing in a landfill, there's a carbon impact and there's um, you know, environmental impacts of disposing of old building materials. And then some people were very kind of nostalgic about the building and considered it historical and worth keeping. So that would be some of the pros of renovation. Anna, did you have a question? Yeah, I just wanted to clarify because it's sort of misleading. That first bullet point is that the cost of the building would be seventy-five to eighty-five million dollars. Not that it's seventy-five to eighty-five million dollars cheaper than building new. Yeah, that's. I mean, yes, that's a good clarification. Just, yes, I, I knew it. I just wanted to make sure everybody's on the same page that we're not looking at mm -hmm. that much less money, but that right. would be the cost of a. Yeah, that's what we're looking at the, at the price for renovation in all likelihood. But that's a matter of degree and how much time you want to get out of the building. That's one of the things we've discussed as the working group is to say, well, what kind of renovation do you want to do? The state came in and identified $16 million as a price tag for just identifying the things that are broken on a visual inspection of the building. Well, that's only going to buy you maybe five, seven years on the building before something else breaks though, right? So you got to spend quite a bit of money if you want to get 20 or 30 years out of it. And that's what we've tasked the construction firm with doing. The cons uh, here, they look a lot like the cons back in 2019. Um, one of the things that's come out in all these discussions is you really don't know how much a renovation is going to cost until you do the work because you don't know what's behind the walls. Hooking old systems up to new, we learned some you know, lessons with the uh, heating system upgrade that, that can cause more problems. 
because old equipment doesn't like um, <laughs> like to have the new pressure hooked up to it and causes all kinds of problems. Uh, anyway, um, some of the things that we learned in our interactions with the state is that even if you do come out with a lower price tag, the shorter building life means a shorter repayment term. Uh, if you don't have state aid, all that stuff goes into potentially a higher tax impact, even though the project price is, is lower. So that's something the voters would certainly want to know before they get a tax bill. Uh, long and difficult project phasing, disruption, and cost. We asked Lee, do you think you could do this project or this project could be done in, in four summers? And he said, I think it could be done in 10 summers. Um, so that we'll have a sense of kind of what that would entail, uh, that renovation option. Um, high operating costs, environment, environmental impact of that old building envelope, we can only make it so efficient. And uh, that HVAC system, you know, it's a fossil fuel based system, probably um, would not be unable be able to replace that or convert it to something different. And then um, not meeting the project goals for modern teaching and learning. That's a you know, huge one, certainly for our uh, stakeholders and uh, the administration and the, and our teachers. And then the ability to attract and retain new students is a big part of the financial model for the project. So that's number one. Number two, and this is where it gets a little bit interesting, and I hope this isn't too much of an eye chart, um, and I'll call this the, the, the Josh Linton uh, approach because uh, th this was, um, he was very excited about this as we were doing our walkthrough. And the idea is this, that we would go to the voters with just the high school, right? The next time that we, we, we take something to them, right? And uh, what, and we've had a, a number of discussions about where that high school would go. This is the one where it would go on the football field. Right, and that's not necessarily what we we have to decide. But that's kind of what's what's being looked at now, so that um, the existing middle school would then continue to be in existence. And you can see the layout in the left there of that phase one of that diagram. So you'd put a football field in between the new high school and the old middle school. The old middle school is hooked up to the high school boiler, so you'd have to have some temporary things to you know get it to run. But then in phase two, say five or 10 years down the road, after you've kind of made some upgrades to make sure that the middle school can last that long, you build a new middle school and then demolish the, um, the old middle school and put the football field over there. So it kind of achieves that same um, you know, end state, but you were able to kind of go to the voters with something much less expensive out of the blocks. Um, and the pros and cons there, certain lower upfront cost, if you're only gonna build half the building, that's gonna be significantly less. It's not going to be half, but it's um, it's going to be you know we're we're talking about it as something maybe in the sixty to seventy million dollar range. Um, you've got something that's interesting. I think that Bob Crean identified or, or gave voice to that we talked about for a long time is that separate middle school experience is kind of cool for the middle schoolers to have that they have their own building. Um, it would allow us to draw new students to the high school because you get that that new building. The phased approach is would, would entail a three-story building. That's what, what Lee has prepared. And you'd be able to take like a wait and see approach to see if you're able to drive enrollment. And then the middle school would uh, addition would then be driven by um, you know, needing greater capacity. And you, with a three-story building, you'd actually be able to, you know, go to like, you know, 800. The, the max that we've got with the two-story design that we have now is around 700. And that's if we built back some things that we caught in our last value engineering. Uh, and then the high school portion there on the pro side would be eligible for state aid as new build, you know, versus renovation. You get the longer <laughs> payment term, the lower tax impact. On the minus side, if you wait five or 10 years to you know, build the other half of the thing, it's probably going to be about double in terms of your total project cost. Um, so you have to be doing pretty well as a district and on the enrollment front to be able to make that case to the taxpayers. Um, you, you're going to have a lot greater operating and program costs because of efficiencies that get lost. You take um, the two buildings and you split them apart. You've got to, you've got to be able to share staff as much. Oh, my lost a, uh, anyway. Um, and then, um, like I said, you'd have to add in the, at least the version that I showed, you'd have to have a, an auxiliary boiler and some temporary mechanicals uh, for, the, for the middle school portion. You'd have uh, a significant amount of, not as much as a renovation, but there'd still be a good amount of cost around you know, the project phase and the disruption, temporary costs. You would be able to keep the uh, high school in existence until the new high school is built, though, and that's, so that avoids most of it. So, but there'd still be some logistical, um, you know, issues with, with the two buildings. 
And then uh, you're looking at uh, like short short term investment in those middle school spaces would continue to be limited and not um, you know fit the program needs that we've identified as being important. Uh, more difficult to attract new students to the, to the middle school portion. And then um, uh, of course the no, no state aid for those renovation costs. And the high school aspect would require reapproval. We've got the approved design for the um, the current new build option. But you'd have to go back if you're completely changing that design to create a three-story building. And then um, that redesign work, we we you know paid most of a million and a half dollars to Valley Brenzinger to you know build that uh, build out that option to get us as far as we were able to get before we went to vote. We'd be looking at spending you know most of that money again. Um, and uh, it, because of that, the time that would be entailed in that option would be a you know a year before we'd be able to go back to the voters. So March time frame. And the last option um, is what we took to the voters in March, and then just trying to um, you know update the see what we can do with the scope to make it potentially cheaper and uh, get it, get updates on the uh, the pricing from the construction firm. Pros there, you know, we've got a complete design, it's approved. You could go to vote as quickly as September. Uh, you'd have a high degree of certainty about the price because the design is as far along as it is. Phasing is simple, low disruption, uh, the least of the temporary cost that you'd have because it's the same, you know, building on the football field. The existing building is in full operation until the new one's ready to go. Then you just move across the parking lot. If you build all new, all now, you have um, much higher operating program efficiency. You avoid that kind of duplication of staff. You get the benefits of you know, the new building envelope across the you know both both sides of the uh, curriculum. So lower operating costs and program efficiencies, and you have the ability to you know, recruit to all grades with the new building. You're looking at something that could last you know seventy plus years. The cons. Um, Price is the big one, the same thing the voters had the biggest problem with. With escalation, we're looking at a, a base design over 99 million and taking a $100 million plus price is going to be a pretty tough sell. So if we think we're going to go back to voters in September with something that's like 102 or 105, that's going to be pretty rough, I would say. Um, and it's difficult to reduce price. We've done, you know, 16 and a half million bucks worth of, of um, you know, those, that value engineering. So from here, I guess to, to Corinne's point, um, if we make further cuts, we're looking at loss of programs and we want to be very transparent about you know, decisions on that front. If we were saying, okay, we got it down to 90 million, but you know, there's no you know, uh, AP chemistry or, or there's only one gym or whatever it is that you have to do to, to, uh, to get to that. Um, that uh, uh, so let's see, oh, I've got, that's not right. The phasing disruption and cost, that's sorry. That's a, a stray bullet from a uh, copy paste. Uh, disposal of the old building. This is another thing. You would have environmental impact there. And the design of this one, if you're talking about like best case scenario, you're really maxed out at around 700 students on site uh, with what you know, Lee is, is designed to date. I mean, it's a lot more than we've got currently around 450. But if we did better than that, we'd be looking at going somewhere else um, to maybe you know build up our uh, you know, um, middle school capacity and making the new building a, a purely high school. So what are the next steps? Like I said, today we're talking about this preliminary review. Uh, in a month, we'll give an update on those options with pricing and associated cost impacts. Um, and then we'll be uh, looking to board members to, you know, kind of have discussions of those options and gather community feedback. Uh, and then on 617, that's the um, the committee meetings evening, we'll make some decisions, whether um, there's an option that we want to move forward on in the short term or hold off for a, a more long-term decision. So that's where we're at. And now we're up to questions, concerns, comments. Josh. So the only thing I did not see was the 2A option, yep. which was the... Which was the most economic of the options. The way to yeah, there were, yeah. like I said, there were a number. Let me just put that up. Yeah, I just didn't see it. So I just yeah, wanted yeah, to make sure that we could see. That sure, option. sure. Let me just put it up for them. Um, so there were three different places that we talked about building the, if we do just the, the new high school option. This is not one I could open. Sorry, yeah. Uh, um, I'm not because I'm sharing my screen. Oh, that's weird. 
Uh, let's see. Maybe it's cursed. Yeah, mine was doing weird things to them. Here it is. I'm not here. Yeah. Uh, can we do it from here? Um, the idea that Josh is talking about is a. I have to spin it. I don't do that. In this control R. Is that right? Yeah. Nope. <laughs> Wrong control. Yeah. <laughs> oh, when I told you not to say that. Just <laughs> to my browser history. Oh no. Oh, Sorry. What a joke. So I'll just voice it. So what what Josh is asking about is what if we built a new high school? Really, where the roundabout is now, hook it directly into the existing uh, middle school, right? And then you'd avoid some of those temporary costs. It'd be more difficult from the standpoint because everything would be kind of bottlenecking there. That's a concern Lee's got, but it's an option that we would uh, potentially have. Another one that we kind of discarded was um, you know, taking down the high school and building it, you know, where the high school is currently, kind of hooking it up to the same spot. But moving down the high school, and I think there's been some rumors that have, have kind of gone around about this from these discussions because some of the discussions went to like. Okay, we need to set up all kinds of temporary classrooms on the football field, maybe for a couple of years, maybe put a cafeteria in Union Arena. Those are all things that make that a pretty untenable option. So, so what's the time period if you were going to split them? Like, what would be the time period where you'd build the set the middle school? What would be? That's up to the, I mean, that's a future thing, right? You're kicking the can down the road on that second option. Yeah. I mean, yeah. You'd have to invest enough to, to, you know, get the building through, you know, five or 10 years. The middle schools but are better. Would you be asking them. for people to vote on a bond when they're still paying for the yes. previous bond? Yes, you'd have to it. So can I, yeah. So the, the theory behind this option was that at that 15 year mark where you really start seeing the, the bond kind of disappear based on the models that were given for the original bill. At that point, you really start to see that the gate. And that's when you'd be able to pick up and build your middle school and kind of keep that impact the same and keep that impact lower, but over a longer period of time with the theory. Um, we'll need to follow up when we're discussing that. I mean, sorry, I just don't have to use my... um, so, yeah, it's just, man. Um, so option three was just presented with some conclusions drawn that I'm hoping we can really look hard at. So it <clears throat> sounded like I heard, heard you say that even if we change the scope, it's still going to be more money. We don't know. That's the concern. I mean, we, we're talking about with, you know, PC and PCI, they're saying like, you know, you're looking at 105 million for the next, you know, you're going to see escalation of like 5% on, on you know, 100 million. Right. So escalation could offset our attempts to cut costs. Right. Um, but I also heard you say that making changes to the scope of the building would have to come with changes like to common spaces or the chemistry classroom. It seems to me like a critical issue in this whole campaign was that voters thought we were building a school to accommodate this future growth that we're that we're betting on that, that they didn't think we were going to get it plus the price tag i'm not denying that 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 right. is huge right so if we can go back saying we're going to build it smaller for fewer students and we can come in with a number that's less i think that's it and then of course more if we can get the state to fund and we can get more private money but but one and two is can we just say we've got the price down and we are going to build a school that will be for fewer kids, but we can add on to it later. I think that's like the winning formula, maybe. Yeah, it depends on how you do it, right? So like one of the ideas that came up in our session at the artistry, um, there was someone there that said, in value engineering sessions I've done, we just went to every kind of department in this building that we we're going to build. And asked everybody, would you really be hurt if we took 10 or 15% off of your area? And everybody kind of said, no, not really. So that building got smaller. With school, you're actually talking about capacity, right? You're talking about capacity for how many students the building can hold. So an idea like that isn't, isn't optimal if you're looking at future growth. Lobbing off um, one of the pods, like we took half of that, that's you know a better approach because you can build that back relatively easily <clears throat> versus you know, making classroom spaces smaller, limiting them to say like 80 students per class versus 100. Um, so, you know, I, I think you're, I like where you're going. We just know from those first value engineering sessions that we took 6,000 square feet off the design and we only saved 2 million bucks. 
doing that. That was half of that pie. Mm -hmm. So in terms of like efficient ways to reduce costs, making the building smaller isn't isn't great, right? So that's where this bullet comes from to say it's difficult. Uh, it's uh, difficult to reduce price through value engineering because we've kind of taken. I think there's potential on the other side of the equation. There's things we could do. Um, and there's discussions. I won't bore everybody. We're three hours in tonight, but things that we can do to increase on, on the revenue side or take things out of the bond price without changing the design. I think there's a lot of potential there. I don't know that we get there by September. You know, one of the things that I thought there was misperceptions was that people were thinking we were going for this Cadillac school with, you know, atriums and all that, not understanding that that was a multi you know, multi-use area rather than having like a lunchroom that you're not going to use for the rest of the day. Right. And they didn't understand it, but they said, oh, you know, you had this fancy atrium with this large glass and everything. And maybe, it, I mean, I know there was a lot of effort at presenting it, but it just didn't come across. A lot of people, I thought that was one of their major, major things. And, you know, I, I don't know if there's ways to present this um, any differently, but like you say, if you start lobbing off things and you're going to save $2 million, you know, you know, you could close it up and have it bricked off and yeah, and it's not going to make that much of a difference. Jim, are we looking at value engineering to, um, tomorrow as a topic? Briefly, I, I've been pushing Paul to have a whole day, a whole session on it, right? And so uh, Sherry and I were coming to Richard really hard to do it next Tuesday. Okay. Yeah, and we'll see. Um, that's getting back to Matt's point, but I tend to agree with you. Like looking at the voter surveys, that there were a lot of people who were uninformed or had notions that you could easily say, "Well, no, there actually isn't a dome," you know. Yeah. Um, and, or no, there there, there isn't a, a turf field. Right? Um, so there's probably some some. And, and I had right? even my neighbors say, "Well, you know, say basically, you know, it's it's good enough for a. It doesn't have to be so special. It's good enough for a public school, you know." And I was like. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, right. So, so go back further for Josh's idea uh, when we were discussing the idea of the high school being built in front of the current high school and then being attached at some point with a renovation down the road, 10, 15 years or so, to the middle school. Uh, when the lawn got voted down, uh, we started a a fund or so to prepare for catastrophic failures over the next year or two or three years while we're still at the old school. So there was a question brought if we presented to the people for the bond uh, with this phase program at a high school now, middle school later, if we could put be in a lower tax burden with just the school for now, could we set aside a million dollars each year over the next 10 or 15 years? That when it comes time to do the middle school renovation, that we take that to soften the blow on the next impact of the middle school. Yeah, I think that's really smart. Um, the challenge that we've got for the school districts across, you, know, you, you don't need to have it. However, you do it, Jim, like such funds and this sort of thing. But like that's uh, right. uh, managing your finances with the, with the goal towards building it. No, I, I want to yeah, share sure. that the current ways and means bill in front of the legislature and it has not been taken out at the Senate level. Any money you put in a capital reserve fund is local only. It won't be state funds. So it will be above and beyond your state ed tax. So I love the idea of capital reserve funds. They're making it difficult if this bill passes to do that. Yeah, I government. No, so I just want you to know that. But I don't think it's the lost cause. I mean, if you're looking at building up, say, like your fundraising capabilities, you know, looking at, you know, going to donors and saying, let's let's finish the job, whatever your campaign is on the on the middle school. Mm -hmm. Just so if it was to go back to local, then it would be funded by every taxpayer homeowner in the area right. in, in our district in our district it's still an education tax though right? it's it would be an additional education tax right? yeah. so you'd have your state ed tax and then you'd have to vote on this separately and be in an enhancement or an addition to I mean, just remember your comments josh when you were talking about the non-homestead taxpayer problem i don't think that would say that would that's what i was now i, 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 I do that. not believe it would impact the, the non-homestead right so, one other question is there a an arm of this strategy to include advocacy with the government. 
Yes, yeah, and that's something uh, Corinne and I met shortly after the, the bond failed with the community volunteer to talk about options for that. I think we've all just kind of recognized the limits of our capacity, you know, right, in terms of what we, we got the ability to work on. But um, we've certainly talked with our, our representatives and there's, um, you know, several things that I think we can do is involve community members to sound the alarm. But anyway, this was really intended just as a tee up. Um, but go ahead, Lauren. Um, I was just curious about the plan. Do we have a plan yet for how we will communicate after the June uh, meeting? You said you had a timeline of you know, June 4th, yeah. 17th. What, how are we going to do it? And I left that kind of vague uh, in terms of communication of options and gathering community feedback. Um, I think that's up to us. You know, what we want to do, we've talked about like having community listening sessions. I think once we have you know pricing that's always been the thing that's been kind of what we needed to push play on any kind of meaningful engagement with voters but that'll be you know a month or so from now so we've got an interval here to make some decisions i think the latest idea is yours and that is maybe we have a session in the gym where we've got people in four corners so, um, and we invite people to come and designate topics whether it's you know financing or you know um, athletics or whatever it is that we want people to engage on and that's the best one I've heard so far. Um, if we don't do it that way, it's going to be up to individual board members just to have communications with community members before you vote. Yeah, I'm just thinking like if the board doesn't hear until June 3rd, what that plan is going to be, and we're supposed to start implementing it June 4th, mm -hmm. then we might not have enough time. Yeah, so. yeah that's the window. It's a couple of weeks there between yeah. when we get the information we need to make decisions and then when we vote. All right, thanks everybody, and we'll uh, keep keep everybody tuning them on where we uh, where we go. Okay, well we're almost done, but we do have important work right now to approve the minutes from the previous meeting. Okay. So if somebody would like to make a motion for that, I'll make a motion. Thank you, Josh, and a second. Second. Thank you, Anna. Uh, all in favor of approving the minutes as written, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. Um, we now have an opportunity for a second uh, round of public comments. So if there are any members of the public who would like to speak, um, most of you would be online, uh, online here. Please um, uh, make your, tell us your name, your town. All right. It looks like there's no public comment. Thank you. Um, and we have an opportunity to reflect on what we did well and what could we do better. Short on the meetings. <laughs> yes, uh, Corinne. Um, I'm curious about to what extent the board or in, in what way the board will be able to discuss slash respond to what was brought up tonight in public comment, which is, I guess, if this is about what we've done well or what we could improve upon, I guess it's in that what we can improve upon. Because um, to some extent, sometimes I feel like issues come to the board and as a board, we don't necessarily, there's no room in the agenda to speak to them, or we're not sure the protocol. Um, so I'm just raising that. Well, personally, I think we need some more information around um, the the reasons why these uh, this will move to the level it was with four teachers and the fifth teacher doing something else. Um, and whether there are things that can be mitigated there. I think we need more information. That's right. So, so do we just ask to get more information at the next board meeting so that we can sort of assess what's going on? Finance committee? Yeah, the finance committee would be the, the committee that would be uh, looking at that because it's a budget item if another teacher is added. Currently, there's no room in the budget for adding another person mm -hmm. so are you suggesting we tell our townspeople to attend the finance committee if this is a concern that they want to follow up on that would probably be a good idea oh, great 
<laughs> but do we want to respond in some way and say, we hear you, we're working on things? Yeah, I, I mean, I think we could use our usual mode of communication through the uh, principal's newsletters and the, the, the Lydia and Sam show on sending materials out through that with a statement around that we we've heard yeah. what you're saying we are, we want to meet the needs and please come to the finance committee meeting where it will be discussed as a budget item but between now and then i'm sure there'll be some talk around um, you know ben and i meet every tuesday with sherry so we'll talk and by the way we did want to say that if any people would like to come to that meeting. It's 8.30 to 9.30 approximately on Tuesdays. You are welcome to come in and sit with us. Um, yeah. yeah, we were thinking to rotate through it, maybe. Yeah, yeah that was the idea. We talked at our last meeting, uh, more than kind of, uh, I think some of the feedback we've gotten, it's our second year doing this now, and I think it's been a criticism of other uh, chair and vice chairs, is kind of the transparency of that weekly meeting. It would be good, I think, if um, you know all the board members had a chance to kind of see that if they want to. So maybe a, a rotation. Right. So every Tuesday, but I mean, I'm happy to send out dates to you all at least through to June. And if you want to sign up to come, or let us know you're going to come. I mean, I think we need 19 people at the meeting. It's small. It would fit into the fans office <laughs> space that we use in Woodstock. So, uh, but yeah, we would welcome that. Um, is there a Zoom option? Because I mean, I, my job starts at nine. Yeah, so we could like, probably do a Zoom option. I don't see why not. It's just a small group of us. Ryan? Were we aware that with all the common and stuff, um, I mean, it seems like all across our school was very concerned and has been for a bit about the classroom sizes doubling or expanding dramatically. Were as administration in general, were we aware that? There was one increase in that we're trying to steer as far as teachers, or is that like something that just developed with the one teacher leaving? I mean, I'm just, I feel like from the amount of people that show up from the public to the amount of people on the board that even knew that there was such an issue coming with kid to teacher ratios at Prosper, uh, how it got to be so concerning that 30, 40 people showed up in regards to it, and we haven't discussed it before. So I'm just curious on when it became obvious or looking like we we're going to go to that ratio. And is there ways to be more ahead of it? So maybe we're up to date before the community bombards us. That's all. Yeah, I, I didn't know much about it at all until the last two days. And I got different folks spoke to me and said, parents are coming because they're concerned about the class size, so. Yeah, and, and just how budgets get developed, we begin in July, um, you know, we have a retreat. Um, that's when Jim give us, gives all the administrators, principals, kind of a forecast of what's coming. We look at the per student cost that I share with you at the end of the report, um, just for you to know that, lat, as you can see in this report, Prosper Valley came in as the second highest per student cost just under Reading, it was been the lowest per student cost. So as we anticipated that, that was the challenge of our administration or our principals. How do we maintain an acceptable rate of growth in terms of the budget and still meet student needs? So we've been looking at the enrollments every month for the last year and looking at those numbers and looking at creative ways. How do we maintain the number of FTEs, we did not increase or decrease other than in this office, we decreased the number of teaching positions. We heard about pre-K demands and making sure we have enough pre-K classrooms. We also have been listening to our need for intervention. So who's available to work with students who are not meeting those proficiency goals, as well as the impact of the social emotional needs. And so I, I'm prepared. Um, you know, Dr. C is presenting, presenting with numbers around enrollment and staffing and the changes that have been made. So those have been discussions since last July amongst the administration. Um, you know, we look at and we, you know, when we meet with finance, what are the asks? Every year, finance committee asks, what are our asks? 
And we knew that we were going to have a 16.5% increase in health care. We knew that there were other demands and pressures on the budget. So we did not ask for any additional positions other than moving a teacher into the pre-K. And so that's been part of Ben's presentation all along. And we look at those numbers. I mean, that's what we start with. And we look at how we start. But we funded the position as a board. But there were three, there was a new teacher hired because the sixth grade class this year is huge. And someone paid for it from outside of the district of, of citizen. And then it came to this board whether we would continue funding it. And I thought we agreed we would. So we have funded five full time teacher positions in our budget. Am I wrong? There are five full time teaching positions at Prosper Valley. And there are going to be and just, and the just something five. else, though. Yeah, this next year will be the fourth year that Prosper Valley has been reopened. And the first year we had 94 students. The second year we had 95 students. This year we have 78 students. We're projecting next year at 87. So next year will be our second lowest out of the four years it's been open. So there's a lot of misinformation, unfortunately, that you received from them. I, I don't think so. I think it's just to take the number divided by five and it works. Take the number divided by four and it doesn't. That's the problem. My question, and I agree. I was just saying, and everyone that presented today, which is from our own staff, that we all highly, you know, accommodate and love and support. They're all concerned with it, and a lot of them, like Mr. Hanson, has statements about the ratio. Once they get above eighteen or twenty, is detrimental to the children's education. So. Have we reviewed information like that when discussing whether we hire more added or not? Because if we're doing anything that is going to be detrimental to the future of our children's education, I, that's just stupid. So I just Bob Bob has had his hand up. Okay. Yeah, I concur with that. I, I don't recall one word being mentioned during our two at least two meetings, if not three, where we discussed the budget. Uh, Perhaps it was discussed in the budget uh, committee meetings, but if the budget we voted on cut one teacher at, at uh, Prosper Valley, um, I think we made a mistake. If the budget we voted did not call for that cut, then I say we got to reconsider. Thank you. There are we did not reduce any teaching staff at Prosper Valley. Uh, we did reduce a librarian, which was a point two, but not not classroom staff. So, so how did we get down to yeah, yeah. yeah. How yeah. did the how did the class sizes change so much if there if there wasn't a reduction in teachers? Like I said, there was a lot of misinformation, unfortunately. So can I, I ask you this, Jeff? Since you, how many students do we have? You said next year, eighty-seven. We're projecting eighty-seven. So if you have eighty-seven and you have five teachers, that's less than twenty. That's correct. So where so, was where so is the information if, coming? If, I just try to if make there sure. were five classes with five teachers, that's less than twenty. Yeah, I can't speak to the educational organization of that building. Can somebody speak to the organization? Can we add Aaron contributing as the leader of the I don't want to play out the yeah. value of your video. I don't yeah. know. I'm sure. Um, <clears throat> so there are five teachers in the state of Vermont. It doesn't require uh, a specific certification for intervention. Uh, back in the fall, we looked at all of our numbers and all of our needs, and we looked at class size, uh, and we were asked to be innovative and creative, as uh, as Ms. Sousa has pointed out, based on all of the things that were coming down the pike. Um, I took that literally and wanted to be innovative and creative with what we had, knowing we weren't going to be able to add anything um, and hoping we weren't going to take anything away. So by re-looking at the uh, five teaching positions and looking at our needs, looking at class size, looking around the district and seeing that we historically have uh, used mixed grades for really small class sizes, uh, but also thinking about what it might look like to do mixed grades to reduce class sizes seems like an innovative approach. Um, it also uh, has the ability to have a full-time interventionist, which we have certainly have the data to support. We certainly need that. Uh, we have vast we block quite a few students that require uh, tier two services and interventions. Uh, so we haven't had that. So over every year that we've been budgeting, we've slowly but surely increased our staff 
uh, even as we had two years of consistent students uh, about in the 90s. Uh, then this year, a drop off with the most capacity we've ever had. And the next year, uh, a slight shift internally uh, with, uh, with approximately 87 or 90 students. Um, so just trying to be creative with what we have, we haven't been able to add, uh, except each year we've been able to um, to work on little things. Like we've had two part-time uh, counselors in the past. Now we have one full-time counselor that's uh, 0.95 FTE, that, that's growth. We've had the SEAL, who's a social emotional learning position, which is uh, privately funded uh, this year and next year. Uh, collecting data to be able to advocate support for that as well. Um, we also had the need for increase in special education, and that was again that wasn't going to be able to go forward. Um, so we bring forward all of all of the things that we need. We hear from finance, twelve percent or something increase isn't going to be able to go forward in the community. So we work really hard to be innovative and creative, and looking at the trends, but also looking at the different models in the district and around. Um, so, yeah, there's opportunity in the schedule uh, because the schedule that we've also been working on as a district also provides opportunity uh, for us now for the first time at Prosper to actually schedule academics first. So these larger blocks of learning have the ability to be scheduled first uh, as opposed to up until this next year, we've been scheduling PE first and then piecemealing academics around it and looking at contracts and making sure folks have prep. So as far as you know, pedagogically speaking, it's an important opportunity that we can start looking at the programming and academics and scheduling those things as priorities uh, and then piecemealing other programming around it. Um, so these are potential opportunities. You could have four home rooms that are mixed, but you could also create blocks of learning where um, they are not mixed home rooms for academic. They're grade levels for academics. Um, we have also more capacity than we've ever had. Uh, so we can also schedule uh, a way where they're uh, also thinking about the tiers where you're thinking about, okay, direct instruction here. We have other staff available for pushing in uh, to provide smaller groups. Those folks can also pull students out to create smaller groups and target the, the teaching uh, to meet the learning needs. So um, there's, there's a variety of, of different models and ideas uh, on the table. And as we've been talking about them and playing with them and bringing them up with staff over the past few weeks, Concerns have, uh, legitimate concerns have come up. Um, so I think the, the community and, and teachers um, uh, have the right to come and share their concerns. Um, I think their concerns are my concerns. I'd like to have more, more teachers as well. Uh, but again, throughout the, the budgeting process and trying to be as innovative and creative as I can to bring forward a budget that, that can be supported. Um, it looks really different than the past few years have at Prosper. There's no, no doubt about that. Um, so there are a variety of things we can be looking at. There's a variety of scheduling um, options we can be playing with. Um, that is not just this one, you know, this idea that it, you know there are mixed grades all around all the time. That's also a possibility, and that's currently part of practices in our district. Um, but there's also other ways to look at it. Um, but so for teachers next year and a full-time interventionist um, has the ability to meet more of our academic needs and. Um, having five homeroom teachers and no interventionist also has the ability to meet academic needs. Um, so it's just trying to play with and make the most of the different positions and trying to move the, the shells around to make the most sense. Um, but I think all said and done, if I continue to keep up with my numbers of math, I think the net, the net loss from 90 something students and 10 or uh, where we were at 78 students right now with 11 FTEs, and that's not even including PE, art, music, Spanish. Also, we'll have more flexibility in our schedule with next year because it's more than really hard to uh, get them in one place at a time. So, traveling around the district, providing services in other places, we've all been working on that. So, we're not losing teaching and learning time to, to traveling. So, next year, we'll also have the opportunity to have music point to just at Prosper. So, so Aaron, is, it, is there... it safe to say that there's still discussion going on around the concerns that were raised tonight or? Absolutely. Okay. There's scheduling, uh, scheduling work that's been happening yep. uh, with Mr. Workman that will continue tomorrow at the staff meeting with Mr. Workman and the staff um, to play out, you know, ideas that, that work uh, and to tease out things that may not. Um, but yeah, so there's, there's scheduling, more control over the schedule uh, so we can actually 
schedule academics first which is a priority of the scheduling scheduling audit is my understanding uh, also again have more specialist teachers available on specific days instead of someone coming and leaving provides us an opportunity uh, to uh, outside of their contractual teaching their duty free lunch and prep there could be one to two additional classes available for these folks to also be supporting staff and students so i'm trying to be really creative and innovative with, with okay. what i have I and I think, I think it's really important. What we're struggling with tonight, boards all over the state have been struggling with for the last four months. And I just left Montpelier for three days last week. Next year is going to be even more challenging. I just want to be really honest. What we're looking through coming in with the yield bill, it's going to be hard. We're going to have to make some really hard decisions. Can I just ask one quick question? So in theory, are there are there certain classes, and you'll get the answers to this yes, yes, no. In theory, there should be classes that are easier to teach with a larger class versus classes that are so easy to teach with a larger class. Like, for example, you should be able to have 20 kids in B, maybe, but then you got 20 kids in gym. I mean, that was math. You know what I'm saying? Like, P versus math are two different things. So, it, it just is that something you guys you have looked at? It's like maybe the PE class could be two classes. In order to free up one teacher for yeah, yeah that, a smaller class, I mean, with that specific example, that could that that very well could be, and then often then a natural concern would be, well, if I'm teaching twenty kids in this class, I'm teaching thirty in this class, you know, classroom management, many behavior challenges. Um, there's there's those concerns as well. So, um, yes. Yeah, so I'm just saying it's just a theory. Well, yeah. I think it will be helpful if we could get an update from you in June as to where things are at and in you know, let the the people who are concerned, they need to be able to express their concerns. Mm -hmm. But we also need to know that you're all working on it to minimize, you know, that you're not going to have 28 kids in a room all day long. I'm assuming you know, break them down into groups. That's right. The intervention is to teach some classes. There's lots of ways to the the numbers, the, the stark numbers can be mitigated. There are, and, and trying to be creative and innovative and also bring a buddy forward that is supportive. Right. Um, yes, Adam. And then Matt, I think no, she put it. I just asked a personnel question, or is it is Miss Karashin not where? That's the body that's missing. So Ms. Koresh is going to be teaching uh, intervention next year. No longer as a homework. So we still have that teacher. There's mm -hmm. still five professional educators mm -hmm. being creative about roles to meet the needs without increasing yes. and uh, a net loss of like a 0.5 FTE. Mm -hmm. All said and done. Mm -hmm. I would, my comment is just I think waiting until June is too late. If, if the solution is going to be posting a new position mm -hmm. I would I would say expedite it can we have on finance in two weeks um if it can wait two weeks maybe I didn't hear a single teacher from that school support the idea that we would have 20 kids in a classroom and I hear parents who will pull their kids out of the school so I just think it's urgent yeah especially because we just come in the new hires or whatnot that it's a crucial time over the upcoming months to hire positions that we're trying to fill. So if we're going to appoint a new position right away, we should probably do it. I'm curious if it's been explored at all. The fact that, well, and I'm not sure the numbers, but um, we, you know, we do have some other elementary schools that may have fewer kids in their classroom and there is school choice. So you know, obviously people don't want to send their kids really far away, but, you know, some folks who live in Pomfret may, you know, a handful of kids may, could maybe go to Barnard. I don't know. I don't know the numbers, but I'm just curious if that's come up in conversation, because that is one of the, I guess, potential um, strengths of having having the the choice amongst schools. Mm -hmm. Yes, Adam. Uh, I guess a takeaway I'm having after Dr. C, you know, um, providing information is we're not we're not talking about a, a variation in ratio. We're talking about a different model of of a calling it an elementary school or a, a middle elementary school, right? That there's we're going to still have the same amount of licensed teachers in the building, 
but we're approaching it in a, in a different way than the traditional you stay with one teacher all day and that's that's your class and like, yes i think right. based on the variables before we do this process that's those are the types of questions that, uh, that need to be asked and, and explored uh, but yes ultimately so like breaking it into you know layman's terms of it's you know and we've kind of talked about prosper valley in this way when we you know brought it back into the district is it's really it's a pre-middle school right um and what i'm hearing you described is like that connects it more to, with me of a pre-middle school that you don't spend all day with one teacher as you do in an in early elementary school series. So, so what you're saying compartmentalizing to some extent is also in part. Yeah. Uh, but when we opened the school in 21, 22, there were 6.6 .6 professional staff with 92, 92 students. It does not include special teachers. Uh, that would be four, four grade level teachers, a special educator, a principal, uh, a point two intervention uh, and a point four counselor. Uh, the following year, same number of students with an increase to 9.2 FTE, still not counting special teachers. Um, this current year, we're at 78, the lowest number, and we're at 11.45 FTEs with two of those positions were privately funded. Um, so when I look at the numbers and then look at next year, back this past fall, looking at the numbers projected for next year, and I see between 85 and 90 students. Um, it's time to get really creative when we look at this year to year, um, because every year it's different. <clears throat> every year we have ebbs and flows of students. So how do I maintain as how many FTs as I can with fluctuating student population and it will continue two years of decent size but it drops right off again so i've also been tasked with looking at this with fresh eyes every single year budgeting um, annually um, in that way so yeah there's a variety of ways to look at it um, on paper and in conversation and there's also what plays out in practice and that's i think as we're having the conversations and playing out the schedules as a staff legitimate questions are coming up as to visualizing different models um, and seeing ourselves in it and also um yeah but yes yeah. all right I, yes. I just wanted to clarify or have someone clarify what are the action items the board is doing or the steps that we're supposed to do to, get, to sort of solve this in the next few weeks are we you know get yeah. some more information and then i mean or yeah, it would be helpful to have some more because people may contact us as board members and say, what are you doing? So if we can have I mean it some they presented it. I mean, it seemed to me they're presenting it as a kind of you know, here, this budget thing just approved a budget and it doesn't I mean I'm not clear is that that's what it is for. Right. It's not in the budget. So we we don't have really a lot of capacity to find money in the budget. Pretty tight. I thought the budget had five teachers in it. It does. The fifth teacher is going to be an interventionist. So the teacher will be at the school seeing students, which would take load out of some of those classrooms, you know, in that scheduling process. So on paper, there would be 27 students, well, 20 whatever students in the class. But in reality, on a day-to-day -day basis, some of those students would be not in that room. Well, so they would be in the working at an intervention. Yeah, or the interventions might be in the room working with specific students. I mean, there's, some, there's many ways. That's right. There, thank you. There are many ways. We're trying to figure out the best way to step into next school year uh, with what we have. Yes, I'd like to briefly reflect on the board rules for public comment. We currently do not have a rule or guideline for repetition right. um, versus agreement. I think um, we had over 50 minutes of public comment tonight with over 16 people who spoke on two top. Um, and there didn't seem to be any way for them to say, I agree. Instead, many people spoke for over five minutes repeating things that had already been said. And I only say that out of respect for everyone's time, but maybe women might want to add a rule 
that speaks to agreement versus repetition. Mm -hmm. Yes, I agree. We just have the, the um, mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> um, I agree with you. Uh, <laughs> All right. No repetition. This is not reflected in the public comment section we have in our book that says what the delays are, because we just use the state ones, state divided, but uh, we can add something. I think it's, I mean, we, uh, I think Ben, you mentioned in passing, um, you know, it's a couple of times a year that we have such a turnout in terms of public comment. Um, and as a board, we've uh, progressed a long way in terms of decorum um, and quality interactions with public. Um, and I think we, you know, we've kind of relaxed that. Um, and we watched that happen tonight in terms of um, length of comments, uh, interacting back and forth during public comment. Um, I just think we need to be aware as a board of that, you know, we start to set a precedent and it become quite unruly as we start interacting and going back and forth. And um, part of that is, I think, educating public as they come and commenting that this is public comment. This is not necessarily an opportunity for back and forth dialogue right. and asking questions and expecting an answer in the moment. Yeah. Thank you. With all that said, I do think it's important that as we continue talking about building a stronger connection with the board and the community that we do value each person's opinion right. and you know we don't feel make them slighted but i would agree with all that right so so i don't know how this would be done but like i agree with what you're saying my question would be when can they have that period of time if they do have email yeah. uh, I, you're not getting a face-to-face -face response then, yeah. and that's when somebody can really schedule a meeting yeah so who do they contact for that? Just just because I know that question could be asked. Well, Board chairs. Yeah, we we get Ben and I I handle a lot of questions and talks with people, that whether it's phone, email, or in person. You raise a I mean you raise a really valid point. I remember early on on the board was so we're raising all this. When are you going to do something about it? When do we actually hear about outcomes, right? And I think that's you know part of that is an ongoing education for. What are Robert's rules of, of a board meeting, but also how does the board function, right? And that a, a board has an, a set agenda that has to follow by. Um, and then I think, you know, importantly, reminding folks this is completely voluntary. Um, right. and, and, and I found everybody here for the most part was incredibly respectful of it. This is voluntary, but reminding that, like, you know, we're at a three and a half hour meeting now. Um, that uh, it's speaking to Heather's point of time limits and, and some order in that profession. And I'm, I'm rambling on, so I'm going to motion that we adjourn. <laughs> There's second. Second. All in favor. Aye. 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 All right. right. Thank you, everybody. Uh, ben Seth, I agree. Also, four. Yes. Yes.